system. Every time the European ask why, 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 why? Why a very young marriage? Why young dead body thrown the river? Big dead body fire? Why every time people coming this river take bath? One time one European asked me, go, mm, why do Indian people use toilet paper? <laughs> Look, how crazy. Uh, I'm to my thinking, you know. Yeah, this system coming, Hindu system, long way. It's no new system. Why, why, why every time I ask? <laughs> We, uh, you're welcome, complete, I can't get up for that. Oof, so you're very slow. welcome, I'm very happy, we are very happy to... That light is going to be like this throughout the... I don't, we can ask to Oof, raise yeah. it. Is like it is possible, is it möglich, dass Licht heute mit die auslöschen, da auslöschen? It's better? Yeah, but it's better. But we don't see the audience really well. Yeah, but I was that's better. That's good. We see you. It's important to see each other. So it's uh, we are going to have this uh, this uh, conversation. We are, we agreed. Uh, we were going to sit afterwards. Uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, the spirit of this morning is a conversation more than a master class. Even though maybe Gianfranco Rosi thinks he's a master, we will we will check that this morning. But uh, in interesting for us is really to, to watch different aspects of his work uh, and uh, keeping attention for the different films you made, the five main films you made since 1993 till today. Huh? And uh, we, you know nothing about the excerpts, the fragments I selected. So you will react on them. Of course, you are invited to, uh, to intervene, to ask questions, to, mark, to make remarks anytime. We have a microphone in the room and you can really uh, just raise your hand and say, please, I want to say something, to share something with us. Uh, Gianfranco, uh, we're going to jump in your work, mm -hmm. try to open your, your, uh, your this, this wallet with your methods, your cameras, your sound recorders, your, your way to live, to live with the films, in the films. But the first question may be, why did you accept to be here this morning? <laughs> I was asking this myself this morning. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but it was not easy to accept. I, well, I accept before because we have a long, long time relationship. Uh, actually, you were the one that showed my first film, Boatman, in Locarno. And then we went through so many years of work together when I was in Geneva. And then you fired me from the school and you took someone else, but that's. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, uh, but when you asked me, uh, how come you're not here? It, w it was difficult to say yes, because when I'm working on a new film, I try to forget about my past uh, work. And uh, every time for me when I start a film, it's like the first film, you know, I don't want to have any link with the past. So I really tend to, to remote myself from my previous work. And uh, now be here and talk about my previous work is a challenge. Uh, as I told you, like I didn't prepare anything. I don't want most of the film I never saw again after the mix. So it's been a really long time for me. From both men to this is like more and more and more far away. So the memory sometimes is very foggy. But it's interesting every time, as I said, I don't, re I don't prepare anything here for master class. So, and that's why I don't like to call it master class. I like this to be more conversation. And every time is a challenge because always new things uh, come out. Uh, so for me, always I discover certain element uh, when we are the public because you are somehow forced to think. If you are alone at home, you don't start thinking about your work. You know, you just 
go away from it. Uh, but here, uh, somehow, you're going to force me to to give some answer, and hopefully not uh, always stupid. Uh, sometimes you have to elaborate and think for a good answer. Even if you don't have an answer, <laughs> you invent one. <laughs> I remember once someone asked me why, why I should always be cloud. So if you want, you can ask me later. Later. <laughs> And I didn't know why, I never thought about it, but I had to invent something at that moment and it looked like I thought about it for many, many years. But. but let's begin with this why, why, why? These fantastic questions. And you, you don't answer this question in the film, of course. Well, we have to stand up. Yeah, you, we can't sit now. <laughs> we, we began. It's going to be a long day. Yeah. And so, uh, Can you see me if, you, if I'm down? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the main question in your film. So why, why are you meeting persons, why are you going in different fields, why, why? <laughs> and maybe the, the, the precise question for Bootman is, when did you decide to, to make this film? It's always a combination of, of chance why I start making a film, a chance and necessity. But first is chance and then once I'm in a, into an environment, uh, it become a necessity that, and uh, it's always uh, start with uh, a curiosity from uh, a place. In this case, it was Benares. You know, I I was at NYU as a student. I was uh, doing my master in the film there at NYU, and uh, I was quite young, didn't have any experience uh, with uh, with the camera. But then I did a short film in Miami. Uh, at the time, Miami was not like a glamorous city like it's now. It was like a people where people go to die somehow. Uh, and uh, pensioners, re people in retirement, they, go, they used to go there to end their life. So it was a bit a city of death. And I did a short film uh, about these people touching the water, entering the water, this contact with the water. And someone saw the film and said, oh, it looks like Benares. I always heard about Benares, and I said, oh, it would be interesting to go there and do like a little <laughs> a short film about that. And then, of course, when I went there, things became completely different. But again, there is no film for me if there is no an encounter. And this is very, is true for all my work. All the film, uh, it starts with a place, and then in within this place, I have to meet someone. It's like almost a very strong, uh, um, uh, tight that has to happen. This is immediate, you know. It's like it's like falling in love. Somehow, you know, uh, you never fall in love. I know because you're a hard man. But <laughs> if you had that privilege, it happened like that. <laughs> then maybe it's wrong, but somehow it's really a matter of uh, a click. And uh, it's like uh, Calvino used to say: the truth is the moment that you encounter something, and the moment you turn. It's passing by, the moment you turn, it's already gone, and it's not there anymore. So it's that kind of uh, small moment that is important, that I always look for. And that would happen in Benares. When I, should I go, how would I start this film? I, I will show, we'll show another excerpt, but <clears throat> But go it's ahead, interesting but, way, because I spent one month without shooting anything, till I met Gopal, and that's when the film started. You mentioned your studies in New, New York. In a few words, you were born in 63. You're still a very young a man. A few different theories, 63, 64, 62. What do you, what, which one do you prefer? Uh, I, change, I keep changing it, it depends on the moment. Okay. And I had two, pa two dates also in the passport that are different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Italian and American passport. American. Why, why that? Uh, well, I took the American passport because I was living a lot in, uh, in the States, but not enough to, to have a green card because uh, if you don't leave straight for six months, you lose your green card. And I was going always back and forth traveling. So once the lawyers say, either you take a passport or you cannot come back here anymore. So that's what I did. And I took my passport with Obama during the Obama time. So it was easy to, to swear my, my uh, you know, affinity towards the States. Now I would love to give back my passport, but it's very difficult, I think. Did you show some of your films at the White House? I think, uh, um, not I think, I know that Obama saw El Sicario. Uh, I, knew, I know that. We'll speak sure. about that, yeah. yeah. And in a few words, it, it's, you, you were 19 when you began this film school in New York. No, it's, I was older. At 19, I was doing, uh, uh, I was studying medicine in Pisa. 
<laughs> so the information I don't know where I got I love it. that it's, it's, uh, also it's in biography it's kind it's of word, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I like it but you studied the uh, medicine yeah I studied medicine how long is uh, for two years and and then uh, I thought that you know the moment I had to do the the anatomy exam which was like nine volume in one exam I thought this was a crime against humanity <laughs> And I know that I could never do that. You know, it was like studying uh, nine uh, phone books, just memorizing, memorizing, memorizing. And I said, I would never do that. And then I give up. Uh, and, uh, and then also when I was uh, supposed to study medicine, uh, anatomy, there was this essay movie in front of my house and I started going to the movies instead of studying anatomy. And that's where I started switching. Because I, I start late watching movies, maybe when I was uh, 17, 18. So that I lived before in Africa, in a place where there was no really cinema. Uh, a few words about this life in Africa, why? Because of your parents? Uh, that's a long story. But in a few parents, words? And then there was an accident with my sister, and then my parents uh, had to stay there, and then I was born there. In Eritrea? In Eritrea, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But do you, ha do you think you have some of your roots uh, in, in Africa? Well, I was born there, and I spent there till 10 years, and then I left, uh, and um, I'm totally rootless. I think I have my roots in places where I, w where I work, you know, where I, I find my, and then I become like, uh, I always lived there. Like and now I was in the Middle East for one year. And uh, in that moment, that were my roots. Uh, I, I'm completely always moving, moving, moving. I think New York is somehow is my, my city because New York is a place that uh, you don't have to have a, an identity there. So that's why maybe I chose New York when I was 18, 19, when I was 21. And I went there, and that became somehow my my city where I grew up. Till uh, I mean, I still have a place that's a place where I always go back, and where I miss it a lot when I'm not there. So somehow New York is my my type of town because it's a totally ruthless uh, place. Although New York is changing so much since I started working there, because at the time it was really a lab for artists, for filmmaker. From where now it's like a mall. Uh, only rich people can afford to live there. And that's why maybe also I don't live there anymore because I have to rent my apartment in order to support my, my apartment. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so it's crazy. I, I have a place, but uh, somehow it's hard to, to live in New York. That's one of the most expensive cities. And before it used to be uh, cheaper than any city in the world, New York, when I grew up there. Let's, let's see how you begin this first film, 93, Boatman. Zweite uh, Nuschnitt, bitte.
years ago I was in Mexico after the film, and there was a master class <laughs> I was doing. And so they were showing just the beginning of the film, and then I asked to the people, maybe it's more interesting to see the whole film instead of listening to me talking. And they say yes. So they watched the whole film, so the master class was basically, <laughs> the film went, you rather see the movie or me talking? <laughs> What do you suggest just to? No, but that was my only film I did at the time. It was my first film, so there was nothing else. So today we have to go through five movies. So, mm. so you want to cancel this conversation? To no, it's okay. So <laughs> it's interesting. It's a f the beginning of the film. So you're really entering, following people, entering to this in the city near the the the, 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 the river. And uh, uh, could you explain how what are the conditions for you to enter to get in this world? Well, as I was uh, tried before, um, I was telling you, before starting this first frame um, of the film, you know, this film is shot in 16 millimeter. I had very few uh, reels with me. It was so expensive to shoot at the time. It was like, for, I remember still 25 years ago, 30 years ago, like 10 minutes of film was like $400. And $400 30 years ago were a lot of money. It's like $1,000 now or even more probably because uh, 200 was to buy just the reel, and 200 to to develop, uh, and it was extremely expensive. And uh, I just had like a few hours of footage with me. And when I went to Benares, I started going around with my camera. I had an Eclair camera, small camera with a sound device on the side. And I got started going around for one month every day with the camera, like a gardener on Forest of Bliss. <laughs> Going through the city, going through the thing, but I didn't shoot Gardner because you you think you're in this move of anthropological films. Well, at the beginning, that was you know Gardner, it's a Rouge, famous Gardner, only in that school of uh, which you know for me was a big step to do this, you know, because the only reference we had at the time, it was basically this kind of uh, documentary approach, you know, like uh, search the anthropolo ethnical, the anthropological film. That was uh, was the school of documentary. And did you study that at the school in New York? No, New York was uh, wide for me. I went into documentary because um, I I didn't like to to write script, uh, actor, uh, producers, and all the the heavy weight that uh, feature film are carrying. I rather I discovered that I didn't I was. To write a script and having a film and making that film was very boring for me. Like I said, okay, now it's written. I, I'm not interested to to make it happen. That you know, so that's why I started doing this because for me the the story was unfolding and looking for a story. I mean, this was the beginning, so it was not very clear yet to me. But now it's very clear that I know that I would never do a feature film because I know that the moment everything is written down. I would not have that energy. I'm not interested to do that step of creating from the paper to the thing. It would be like a craft that uh, doesn't uh, appeal me. It's not my nature. And then you have to tell a story before you shoot to a producer. You have to convince too many people, actor and actor, big, <laughs> big things to to deal on a set. And uh, so I, I love the freedom that I have of me, my one man crew, and searching for the story. While I'm, uh, the pen is like my camera, you know, and every day I discover a story and just move and shift uh, with the story I discover. So this is what I love to do it. In fact, for me, the process of filming is fantastic and the process of editing is more painful, uh, uh, which I'm going through now on the editing and I'm working with two editors. And, uh, and then it's like another element of recreation. I would like to film, I would love to make a film and not edit. The film, you know, like <laughs> having 80 hours of footage and not edit, that would be my dream. Or someone will edit, you know, when I'm not around anymore. That would be the best uh, solution. You, you never would accept that, never. Yeah, but if I'm dead, it's fine. Uh, after the death, okay. <laughs> but that would be my last film. You know? Back to Benares. So, last film. so you're entering this territory? <laughs> so entering this uh, territory with a camera, and for one month, I literally every day went around with this camera. And I was not able to film a single frame because everything was just images, images, images. And there was no, what I realized later was the encounter. And a few days before leaving, I had a plane to go back to New York. And uh, I said, okay, I give up this project. And I left the camera in the hotel. And for the first time, I went to the river being a tourist because like taking these boats is like 
what, what tourists do. And I said, I don't want to be a tourist. I don't want to take the boat. But the last few days, that's I said, okay, let's be a tourist and go there. And I went and I looked for a boatman and this guy came, Gopal. And I immediately liked him and I chose him to go. So before it was one hour trip, then it was two hour, three hour. Then I kind of bargained a price for the whole day. And I spent with him this whole day from morning till night and everything was like little encounter situation things uh, and the more i was staying with him the more he was getting relaxed telling me stories meeting someone uh, and when i went back to the hotel i said that's how the film should be you know one day with this boatman on this boat where anything could happen and i was naive enough to think that uh, this could have happened in one day <laughs> so the next day i went there with the, all my camera and looked for him and this is somehow the beginning of the film and I started filming the whole day with him. Like I had one hour rolls and I shot the whole thing. And when I went back to New York, I developed this food that it was mostly, it was a disaster. And there were only three good shots. The rest was like mess. But then the three shots that were there were so strong that I said, I have to go back there. So this became like an obsession to go back and recreate somehow the emotional, more than recreate, recapturing that emotional uh, thing. And that's where I learned that it's so important to have that inner feeling. And then it's just waiting for things to happen. And unfortunately, in this case, it, it took me many years. And uh, as I was saying when they were screening the film, I don't know how many of you saw the movie, the whole film. OK, so it's a good number. Um, it took me, uh, what I was saying? Uh, how long you were shooting? Uh, back. back and forth, yeah, because you know, Benares, uh, half of the of the seas was completely submerged. It's like an Atlantis under city, under water, because the river goes up, 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 and then it takes time to go down, down, down. So the best season that like, you could have this kind of uh, uh, environment is just two, three months. So every year I was going back there for two, three months and shoot, and then hoping, hoping that he was there. Gopal. So the film somehow took me four years to do it like that, but slowly, slowly, slowly meeting him and filming was endless, was like really an agony. At a certain point, people thought I was crazy because this film was never ending. Even I finished NYU and still the film was like a work in progress. So it took me, but then this was my school because that, that's how I learned to handle a camera, to handle a situation, to, to think, uh, watching inside a, a a viewfinder and how important it is to hold the camera and make a whole dimension with sound camera and having this very intimate interaction you know i never had uh, people working with me sound or other cameramen because i discovered how important it was to create this intimacy with the person you are working with you know and uh, uh, learning to wait learning to know when to leave uh, learning to know not asking question I just ask because my teacher used to say if you have if you ask ten questions you have ten answer and it's not interesting. You have to grab something which is so special inside that no question can happen. So you have to always wait for that moment, which in this film there are many of these moments. And every moment because I was filming <coughs> in cinema, so now would be so easy because you can roll, 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 roll hours of tape and then there is something good. But there you had to wait exactly for the right moment, press the button and press it back. And this, I was looking always for stories that were beginning and ending. If you see the structure of every story, it has a begin and an end, a begin and an end. So they're like small, small, um, almost like a poetic approach, you know, because uh, every single story starts and ends, starts and ends. So this was like, an, again, I learned this by going back there, by search in the right way of telling a story. And then this became somehow my, my ground of, uh, of filmmaking more than the school. We will watch something. I have two excerpts. I, we have not time enough to show both of them. What, what, which one do you prefer? The one I love with the ch uh, children playing, mm -hmm. jumping in the water, or, or before the, the two tourists, women, watching Indian women wa uh, washing in, in the, in the, fr in the well, the, the moment of the kids is a choral moment. Absolutely. So I think uh, yes? it's fun. Yeah, that's like a... Number four, please.
निर्माण मीरा का मोहन इंदिरा के गीत और संगीत और आवाजे अनुराधा पौड़वाल मोहम्मद अजीज सुरेश मानकर कुमार शानू और यशुदास That was a good story of the woman, <laughs> the woman, so, yeah, the lady. Yeah. We could show so many different <laughs> fragments of the film. This is a, it took me like three years to film her. Yes. Yeah, because it was impossible to film, uh, you know, the woman would be hard to, to have it in front of the camera. And she's a fantastic poet, poetess, one of the best in India. And I went to some uh, poetry recital that she did in Benares, and she was fantastic. And then I asked her to, to, to film her, and she said, no, no, my husband doesn't want, blah, blah. And then... Uh, husband disappeared. And then, uh, after a few years, she came to me and he said, let's do it. My husband left me, and I'm free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she tells this story here. So it's a fantastic watch, watch story. The film. But let's speak about what we've seen. I'm not okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in um, uh, how? What do you think about the influence of camera in this kind of situation? The kids are playing and provoking the boatman, as and you as well. It's it's kind of of play among all of you. Well, again, uh, you know, when you spend enough time in a place, you start learning the dynamics that are around you. And people, they are most of the time they are very ritualistic, you know. They're doing most of the time the same thing. So, once I was there, I knew there were always these kids uh, try to harass me, and you know, like they had the camera, so it was a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, play for them. And uh, and then one day, you know, before I was ex escaping this situation, and then one day I saw that they were under this bridge. And I say, if we go there, they're gonna come, and that would happen basically, you know. So somehow, so you didn't anticipate, order them. Eh? You didn't order them; they came by themselves. 
Well, uh, part uh, they were swimming and then uh, they were there harassing, so I took them on the boat and bring them there. Other they came on their own. So there was like this mix uh, of situation. Plus the bridge was at the time interrupted. So it, it, w it became like a shade for us to go during the day. And so this became a perfect element uh, that, uh, you know, after years I was there, I knew that there was this dynamic happening. So, I, in fact, I show this in two different moments because once uh, the sh when the f there's only the bridge and no car passing, and then when I went back, the car were there, and I brought uh, again the kid there. That's when I brought the kid there, and uh, they just let them play. We spent the whole uh, afternoon there, and and you know, at a certain point, I knew they were like uh, engaging me on some kind of interaction, and that would happen again. It was uh, so much uh, precious what you shoot that you couldn't uh, afford to just keep rolling, 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 rolling. So in this case, uh, I was anticipating as I knew that if I were in that situation, something would have happened. Mm. You said before that uh, the first uh, first shootings, you shot a lot of crap, bad material, and, yeah. and, and, some, and some good shots. Yeah, three. How, Three. Three good shots. Yeah. Beginning. And how do you know? How do you know? During the shooting, it's crap or good? Or do you, do you discover that in the editing table? I, I how do you know that? I had the obsession of Cinema Verité, which uh, slowly, slowly I started detaching myself. And also, the cinema changed so much and what is around us changed so much that before it was important to to stick to a certain method, to a certain thing. And that was the school, you know, the Cinema Verité School, the Jean Rouge, the Gardner, the Robert, the, the, you know, now I don't have to go through all the list of filmmakers of the time, but there was that uh, element of, you know, observing and let things happen and unfold. And now I'm completely opposite. I don't believe anymore in that kind of uh, approach. And for me, it's more waiting for the right moment, create the situation by interacting with someone and uh, and knowing exactly where and why you have to shoot something. So I always, through the time, I break this element. So for me, there's no, when people say it's documentary, it's fiction, I don't care. Uh, for me, it's cinema. So the language of cinema for me is the most important element to carry on, you know? I don't make any difference between documentary and fiction. but. The only thing is documentaries because I don't tell people what to do and I don't use actors and there's no script in my way. But then the language I want to use more and more and more in every film, this is more strong for me, is the narrative language of cinema, you know, to have a, 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 a setting that is so precise and so structured, you know, where things happen from the beginning to the end in the single frame, you know, where that frame, it has to tell the whole story that moment there. I never shoot randomly. When I shoot, I leave the camera there and I let things unfold in front of me. And then I know when is the right moment to, to film. But that element has to become like, uh, you know, people just say when in, 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 a, in a feature film, it's, ah, it's so true. It looks like a documentary. And documentary say, ah, it looks like fiction. <laughs> you know, there is this kind of, of uh, back and forth uh, situation. For me, what is important is uh, true or false. And this is, uh, is uh, for all kind of art and all. Is a picture? Is on a painting? Is on a script? Is on a thing? Is it true or is it false? That for me, what is important, uh, is not gimmick. Is not, uh, and that belongs to the truth of the character that I'm filming. This is for me my, my, my moral when I film. You know, I have to know enough the character to be able to grab something so intimate about him or her, or a place. Itself, because also plays in my film become a character. Bernard is a character. The desert is a character. Uh, the room is a character of the Sicario. Uh, the Sakugra is a character. The ground is the road is a character. Uh, the island of Lampedusa is a character. So it's always start by place. This place has to become a character, and within that place, I have to find people that somehow reflect the condition of that being in that place. And they have to give me back that uh, sort of uh, truth. Any questions, please? Yes. Hello. Uh, for me, this is a difference. If uh, I'm a spectator, if you, if this is something you have conceived and you ask the protagonist to do, it's not truth in a way. I think I have a problem with proof in general. But uh, I remember when I saw you first with the boatman in Freiburg some 25 years ago, 
there was a fest where? in Freiburg, uh -huh. and, and there you said that of the boatmen, every scene was staged. You said, and some people were really shocked. No, no, it was not staged, but it was like very precise where and when. I, I could never say to him what to say, why, 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 it could not be staged, you know? But there were moments that I knew a certain element was yeah. coming out, but there's nothing really staged on the film. It's all like happening in the moment. It's happening. Yeah, I think you said it that, that time, and some people were really shocked that time. I remember yeah. that. Anything I wrote about is never... Yeah, uh, but uh, for me it's a difference, still a difference between documentary and fiction. Because if, if you do a, fiction, a fiction film, you... You conceive you don't have to tell me this because I never stage anything in my work, you know. But I, I spend enough time with the people that I know exactly that putting the camera in a certain way, and then waiting for that moment, then things come out. I think we will raise this question in this morning later on. When I, I, I don't say to people, do this, do that, tell me this, tell me that. You don't do that. No, I don't do that. Okay. Because otherwise, I would uh, write a script if I had to. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. So Never. there is a difference between fiction and documentary. Yeah, but then in the way there is a different. That's what I said before. The difference, like I don't work with uh, actors, and that's why I make documentary. But somehow the language for me that has to be has a cinematic language. I hate documentary that they go around with the camera back and forth and okay. because it's truth, and they have to shoot near. For me, there's a frame, and we did this frame has to. Uh, develop a narration that I keep uh, still very, very okay. still. And that's the cinematic approach for me. Light and thing. I always shoot with uh, when there's a certain light condition and I go there. But, uh, you know, even if you ask questions to someone in stage, you know, because you choose where to put the person seat, you put light and you ask 10 questions and you have 10 answers. So that's more staged than anything. Following someone is staged because you know that with that frame you're already putting a close thing and you know where you're going. You know that keep shooting 24 hours a day. So otherwise become like, a, let's do cinema with the, with the camera on the bank. You know, like put in there and things up on the street. Now there's camera everywhere. But yeah, so you always make choices. That's, um, that's clear. Yeah, you always make choices. But for me, that choice has to be very strong narrative choice, has to be stories, has to be a, a narration on that. I have to look for the dynamic of, uh, of a narration and of a, of a structure always, you know? And subtraction for me is very important word because I don't want to give information. You know, documentary, you have to inform. And for me, less information I give, my challenge is like to give, to tell as less as I can about that and let them the inside story of the people. What I mean is more, more is on the human dimension, more than giving information about it. And uh, so that's where it becomes cinema somehow, because I have then to keep constant. That's why I have to spend one year, two years, three years in a place. Otherwise, I would just write a script in two weeks I can shoot. But for me, it's, it's about time. The story unfolds with time. So and I have to follow the character. Before I, I film, I can spend one month, two months without even taking the camera and spend every day, every day, every day, every day with the, the kids in Lampedusa, with the, the doctor, the things. And then once I know enough of their life, there's enough trust, there's enough things, then you know that when you put the camera in a certain situation, something will happen. And you have to anticipate that something. And by knowing the person, you can do that. If you go in a place and shoot a documentary in two months, it's, uh, it's impossible to go to that kind of truth, which is the, the inner truth of the person I'm working with. Mm. That's why most of the film is about character. And the character, most of the time, are archetype. The Sicari is an archetype, you know? It's something that is a type of man. And I have to be able to grab that, uh, that element. But I can do that only if I know enough the person. If I go there and I just spend two, three days, the only thing to shoot is like randomly following and then in the editing try to, to find something interesting that came out and put it together. And uh, it happened to the, for me, it doesn't happen in the editing, the film, it's happening when I'm shooting. And that's why I spent one year, two years, three years, four years to make this film, because I have to wait for that moment that is already in my mind, maybe, that is about then, when it's there, I know how to, to capture. That's why time for me in my work is the biggest investment. If I would stage, I would just spend like probably 
writing a script in one month and then say, do this, do that, do that. And then I will somehow deviating from the storytelling. For me, the storytelling is part of what happened. You know, the, the lazy eye of the kid, it happened and then became a metaphor of the film in, uh, in uh, Fuoco Mare. I see. Not, I see. Yeah. I, I, we, we agreed I can interrupt him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, of course, of okay. Course. <laughs> so, any questions? Because I think it's time now to to meet Wayne the Insane. Uh -huh. huh? okay. So we leave uh, Benares and we go to the desert. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's a film uh, um, below sea level. Could you explain ten why? Years, ten years later. Ten years later. Why? Why did you decide to to get lost in this desert? Well, uh, again, uh, from Boatman to this film, it, uh, there was a film in between that I never did it, uh, that I started. Afterwards? No, no, no. There was a film that was called Tales of Natural Natural Disaster. And that was really a disaster, that film, because uh, there was like some production problem, the whole negative that I shot was like taken by Fabrica at the time. And, uh, and I mean, it's a long story. It's like more like, a, so there is a second film that I never finished before this one here. And this was somehow a result of a desperation completely because the film I wanted to do, I never had the money and all the, f the f 30 hours I shot was confiscated by, by a production that they never then gave me the money to keep going on that project. So I have to start from scratch. And a place where I could find the synthesis of what I wanted to do, I wanted the desert to become a protagonist. I wanted somehow to find the limit, the essence of uh, the limit uh, through the desert in this film. But the film I was doing before this was everywhere in the States. There's a, so it was a huge production, huge, uh, huge production on sense of space, you know, because to go from Arizona to Texas to Nevada to things, it was a huge, huge work. And that's what the film was. It was called Tales of Natural and Natural Disaster. And, uh, and then became uh, Oakland is not for burning when I met this character the, that is not, never here. And then the whole footage was gone completely and I had to start from scratch. And, uh, and then a friend of mine said, well, why don't you go to this place here where I shot the film? Maybe there you can find still a synthesis of what you're looking for. So I completely desperate I end up uh, in this place where I lived for one month or two months there in this camper myself without even taking out the camera. And the good thing about this place is like nobody asks you a question while you're there, as the characters say. And uh, and as just leaving there, I was totally depressed. I don't know if I was ever making, be able to make another film or if this place was coming my condition of leaving myself. And then um, one day I met uh, uh, Buzz Kenny and I started filming with him. And then the film started taking place. Again, this is a film that took two years to do it where I, I lived there in that place with my camper, and I lived uh, interacting the condition, and then, and then well, we can talk later after you. So uh, we are going to see the except number uh, seven, bitte. Number seven. And then a hole here. No hole. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. And I go, oh, did I, I got, um, <sighs> you motherfucker, you shot me. I saw the smoke come from the goddamn gun. I saw the smoke. He was right there. I saw the smoke come from the gun. Where did I saw it. Oh my God. Where'd it go? It went in here. Ricochet busted everything in my goddamn face. That's all my guy and jaws, everything. Right. Okay, that's why they call you bulletproof. That's why they call you bulletproof. Oh, okay. I the right there. oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> okay, this stuff is like Yeah, it's really something, isn't it? You're shaking too much, honey. You're shaking. Did I scare you? No.
How many wings? How many wings you got? What are you being? So you don't have any wings, do you? Well, I was going to answer the question. No, no, we got to answer the question. All insects have got two pairs of wings, so they can fly. Uh, like a how, how many legs do you have? Uh, uh, two, I believe, huh? Mm -hmm. All insects have <laughs> six legs. They can walk a lot better than you, and of course, they can really fly a lot better than you. And uh, you know, and where's your, your I was just now thinking what you were saying there. You know, like I realized the the thickness of this dialogue. It's imp no writer can write these dialogues. You know, it's amazing. So how can you stage a situation like that? It's impossible. How can you write this? It's impossible. What you have to do is be able to get the trust enough with the people you are with, and be able to enter in that world. And then uh, the duty is like to be able to to feel without judgment, without think, to write, to take the right distance, to to know when to leave, to know when to go back. That's why time takes time, you know. Um, and you know, once you once you are there long enough, you know that if I start going in the car with the guy that dis distribute the water, and there's every time is this because I did that maybe hundred times without the camera. And then every time something is happening, dialogue and things, and then one day you decide to put the camera and something else happened, like a conversation like this one here. This is like a coin brother writing, you know, on the things. But uh, I think really no right. This is like Whitman and Thoreau. This is what the right did. When I, when I did the subtitle of the film, I went through all the script and for the translation. And then I realized how strong was this movie because of the conversation, the dialogue. And again, I said, no actor and no writer could reach that kind of um, 
of essence, which for me that was extraordinary and it was an extraordinary and painful experience. It was very, very difficult to shoot this film, to be there, to film, to go away, to come back, to confront myself with the movie, with them, it was very difficult that too, you know. This film was like completely censored in America because of the scene you show it. Uh, in same way, it's like new Nietzsche somehow, or old Nietzsche, I don't know, it's like a Nietzschean character. And my duty was to show the essence of him, and that was his essence, you know, this madness, and then this extraordinary poetry, because the moment he plays the song to her, he's so strong and beautiful. And uh, so how do you feel in this moment? Is that, do I have the right to be there in the camera in that moment? Uh, yes and no. But then I decide yes. And uh, I remember when the film that was in Venice that won the Horizonte, this film, there was a, it, the film was completely killed by Variety. And their article on Variety say, I'm gonna ask the director if he would ever put uh, his camera in his best friend room while he's making, uh, while he's having a blow job. That was on Variety. <laughs> And this it killed completely the film, you know, in the state. This, this film, the state didn't have one single screening, except now, now it's becoming like a cult uh, film, so it's coming out more and more and more. And uh, in university, they show it, uh, masterclass things, it's becoming like uh, the film. At the time, it was important. No, no festival, no thing showed that film, you know, it was like completely censorship. Because uh, the film was going so intimately in a world that people didn't want to see at the time. This was America in the biggest crisis. People that we know every day in our life. The doctor is an incredible character here. She had, she was a doctor. Sadly, she was on the street because she was not able to pay twice the month the rent of the something happened in her life, and then she was on the street. Most of the people that had the past, and then somehow everything was lost there, and they create this community where there's no police, no firemen, no no things, but still there's an incredible sense of community. And when Variety wrote this article, I remember the, I called, uh, um, who do you call, uh, Michael. Michael is another, the one of the Mosquito. And I say, Michael, so I'm coming to show the movie there. I say, no man, don't come, people are so upset with you. You show in the same way making, a bl having a blowjob from uh, Carol, I say, it's not me, you don't see anything there, it's basically... And then I show him the film separately, and, and uh, we went into in a, in a motel and show him the film, and I said, this is a goddamn movie, let's go and show the film to everybody. And when I went there to show the, to screen the film, people said, well, so where's the blowjob scene? <laughs> you cut it out? I said, well, no, that's what it was, you know? So I said, wow, that's like insane Wayne and Carol, who cares, you know? It was like... But still, the film was completely killed. But for me, my duty was to show, again, the essence of him, and that was his essence. So how that scene happened, I was uh, filming them, the two of them inside the camper, the, when the, 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 the song is. And then suddenly I went to smoke a cigarette outside, and I left my camera there. When I came in, they were uh, hugging, and, and then I started rolling the camera in that moment. I was completely, they didn't look at me for a second. And then I told them, I said, I shot this, is, is that okay for you? I said, who cares, man, I don't care, I don't give a damn. Uh, and, and that, but for me that scene is important because it's exactly the essence of who Insane Wayne is, you know, this madness and again, this uh, incredibly poetic uh, human being that uh, he went through life like uh, to the extreme, you know, he killed like someone, he went to prison for 20, 30 years, he came out when he was a Marines, he killed a, so you, in all your films, you're looking for s small stories, making possible a big story. And, and before uh, uh, Wayne and uh, having this uh, tenderness with his wife, he, you, we see Lily. Lily is a transgender and she was a, um, um, she was a soldier in Vietnam. It's also a picture of... No, Lily, uh, she's a doctor. Uh, no, 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 no um, what's the name of the... Uh, Carol and... Carol, yes. Yeah. She, was a, she was a soldier in yeah, Vietnam. So, uh, so the time we did, and she was a, a macho man, <laughs> and then she, she, she found out. Yeah. That. The most beautiful scene, I think, is the one of the wig. Mm. When she's putting the wig on, I think this is one of the strongest scenes of the film. But it's, again, it's a choral... For me, it was important that every single person, because they reflect the condition of that space, you know? Mm. And that space is called Slab City, and it's where a community, sometimes it's like, what, 1,000, from, it goes from summer when there are like 30, 40 people living there because like 60 degrees, to the winter where the climate is very 
very smooth and, and nice and people live uh, maybe 4,000, 5,000 people live there in these campers. And again, for me, it was important to find this element of that community. But again, it took a long time and took a long time to get the trust to shoot. The first time I met in same way, the first day I went there, I went with this friend of mine that he took me to the place and uh, it was six o'clock in the morning and we heard like bam, 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 banging. And this guy was like, you have anything to drink? Uh, I said, well, we have a bottle of, uh, of wine. Oh, can you give him one to me? I said, okay. And I gave the bottle of wine to him, and he went like clock, 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 and finished the whole bottle like in one minute, like it was water. That was my first encounter with Insane Way. And then after a few months, when I went back and decided to shoot the film there, I approached him in his, in where he lived, and he said, what the fuck you want from me? He said, well, I'm here making a film. And then he took, he had the gun on the side, he said, get the fuck out of my place. I give you three seconds to leave. And I left. <laughs> then slowly, slowly, I met him. And then I cannot say we became friends because it was very hard to have a relationship with him. It was most of the time he was out completely. And again, to find moment where he was more sober or somehow he could have a relationship with him was very difficult. Mm. Um, uh, uh, sure. All some kind of tragedy, you know, from the people that lived there. Yeah. Mm. And you're looking for humor as well. Good, good moments. I, we have one except, very short one, where it's quite funny. Huh? Everything's falling apart. You remember? Ah, yeah. Car. Okay. Ushnit number eight, please. systems can't always work and I know the brakes I've already budgeted out the money for the part but also up here my alternator gauge doesn't work my fuel gauge is inaccurate my temperature gauge is all right my oh, oil pressure yeah. gauge doesn't work and my oh well, that's, that's not important yeah yeah <laughs> well maybe we should find a place around here yeah well we passed a good good spot back here a nice spot I was just coming down to check it out, but when I saw it get steeper and I thought, well, we better turn around. Uh, oh, it varies so much right in here. I mean, here's some more of the delphiniums. Hey, what is that? So hey, beautiful. that's lamb's quarter. Where in there? I'm pretty sure that's lamb's quarter. Back under there. Not lamb here. No, it's not. No. It's a path that people use to cross the border because Mexico is only about three or four miles away and of course they've got to go through all the most rugged and remote places and this is about as rugged as you can get so this is a path and, and that's not somebody's garbage over there that well it isn't sense guy probably got tired and said he didn't need a pair of, he get a pair of pants when he got to where he was going and just threw him down the goal always is it's not really like to walk to Los Angeles or something like that that's almost never done because it's just it's an incredible journey. So they're all trying to get, say, 10 miles past the border where they'll have somebody, like maybe there's a cell phone stash for them that, there, or they bring. Some Um, yes, before, before the, in, in the, in the bus, the bus is, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, 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 not here. But um, um, yes, a, a question about uh, the, the sound. The, the, it's I windy, about it's windy, that. and the sound is so precise. We hear perfectly the voice. Well, another element for me that is very important is the sound. And the only way I can grab this intimacy and these moments is not having a sound man with me because uh, having someone constantly and waiting maybe for three days, four days, one week, ten days before we shoot would be impossible, you know, so I'm always alone. And the only way to grab this intimacy is by putting a, a abalier always. So my first, the first thing I do is always put put a sound and maybe I don't film or maybe I don't, but uh, w w when I know that I'm 
interacting and working with the with the person, I know that this is what's happening now. Uh, I put always the sound in the morning without even knowing if I'm shooting or not. And uh, so this is a very important uh, uh, work for me, the, the ritual of putting on the sound. And it's very funny, like, so, uh, with, uh, sometimes I forget that uh, I leave the, the sound and I go home and uh, I left the sound <laughs> on Michael or, or whatever. And I remember once Michael, I went back in the next morning. I said, "Sorry, I forgot yesterday the sound. You have it." So, oh fuck! Yes, I was completely drunk. I took it off my my sweater, and I don't know where is the sound anymore. So we had spent like two hours to look where was his sweater somewhere, <laughs> with the sound, uh, uh, you know, hidden there. And I was able to find my my little uh, uh, machine. Uh, but you know, because it's very important the ritual of putting the sound or more than filming. Without the sound, um, it's impossible then to film because with the microphone, if you are far away, there's no way you can do that. And then the, the sound it allows the person to be and forget about me, you know, like forget that I'm there filming or if um, I'm start filming where something interesting is happening, then I can just go into the situation. And most of the time, actually always, people, they're never aware of that. Of course, it's a condition that, you know, you know, things change. When you have a camera, no matter what, things change, you know. Uh, when you have a microphone, things change. Things I'm saying now with a microphone, I wouldn't say if I have a conversation. So it's not true that the camera doesn't change. The camera changed me and changed the person that is in front of me. So it transformed the, the relationship in something else. And that's the beauty of it, because you never know what's happening in that moment. Once you start rolling the camera, it's a total mystery of what's uh, coming out from the person. Is the person acting? Is not acting? Well, uh, we all act, you know. When the camera is there, there's a form of acting, for, for sure. There's a form of acting. But then it's like a psych it's an analysis. If you go, uh, the, the analyst doesn't have to think if he's telling the truth or not. But somehow, even if there's a lie, he has to grab from that lie the truth, you know, because it's not his duty to know if it's true or it's not true what you're telling. And I don't have the, the control to say that I'm acting. For me, what is important is that act, it's like Eskilo used to say, acting without the awareness of acting, which is a condition of human being. You know? And the camera forces you to that. You know? It's impossible that someone is... Uh, that element, it transforms. The camera is a division and change me and change that. But then it, that's the beauty of it, you know, because you never know what's happening in that moment you start. So cinema verite has no meaning anymore for you? Well, it has a meaning as a starting point, you know, but then what is verite? I never understood that. I asked this, this in 30 years. And the, ver, for me, the truth is like I have to be loyal to who are you. When I film you, I have to be as close as possible to your personality, to what you do, to what is your your daily life and what is that that's what i have to be able to grab you know and my responsibility is to be as truthful as i can to who you are that's for me the truth what it is you know it's like to respect the essence of the character the essence of the place that i'm filming the essence uh, of the, what that place reflects into the character and what that character because of, is in that place is taking out in that moment and that for me what is the very tame the truth is not my approach to that is uh, is the interaction that there is is trust that you have to to build and the trust is common you know i have to trust you you have to trust me and it's a huge investment on both sides is it's very heavy choice to like, agree to be filmed and it's a heavy choice to choose someone and follow maybe for one year two years three years four years that person and become something else you know because then what you have to put together is the essence of who, who this person is in nowadays you can find on the that's why i will never say do this or do that but i have to be able to know what he does in order to anticipate him on that you know if i know that they're going to a, a trip together i say okay can i come and film say so, yes you come and film and then this trip starts it's like two weeks ten days we've been in this truck together and then daily, daily situation changed to this huge conflict that happened between the two of them and explode on this mess, on this separation. And I was there. Did it happen because I was there? No, because it would have happened no matter what, because the conflict was there already, very strong. And I was able to, to grab because I was there. 
and because I was able to be there because of the trust that uh, 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 yes endured. they're going to have a big big fight big fight together she's leaving she's leaving him uh, but at the end the, the cop again the cop again so but back on a separation yeah. that's the end of the film but they they are they hugging together kind of close together yeah. that's a happy the, end you wanted that's a happy end you you script you know well but they accept also the separation it's also very sad that moment because she lives in a tent with no future he has this broken car the van is the, his bus is falling apart completely and uh, and it's hard to witness all this you know to be part of that one question there and um i would like to know um, in your work and especially in your recent work your camera is not moving you choose fixed frame uh, why do you choose not to follow your protagonists with the camera with the image because i get more and more um, i want to be now in the frame extremely precise and i want to create a, a, a space and in, within this space things has to happen and I'm able to hold that uh, that frame for days till something happened in that frame there like I want to construct things in a way that this becomes somehow the the all essence and I'm waiting for the moment where start where things happen in front of it from beginning to the end like a narrative structure and uh, and uh, yeah I, I, I detach myself on, I, I never really followed Sometimes, uh, because in no film I follow someone, it's always a frame, somehow more stable and unstable, but I never really, uh, uh, like my the, the, um, the Belgian filmmaker, what's his name? Uh, Dardenne? Dardenne, yeah. Now there's this fashion of Dardenne, like falling, falling, falling from the back, constantly falling, falling, falling from the top, from the thing, like switching frame 20 times. And I don't, I don't like to cut scene, you know. I want more and more the scene to be one scene, beginning and end. One scene, beginning and end, no editing. And then the editing happen on from scene and to see a continuation of that scene to another character, to another story. I don't like to interrupt the scene on the editing. I want the scene to happen more and more in that within one frame. And that has to be the, 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 the space of the unfolding of my story. Mm. But you you say that uh, you don't you are not making anymore a cinema verite. No, so no, I don't say. But I don't know what it is anymore. I don't say. I never made cinema verite. I don't know. Did uh, Flaherty make cinema verite? Uh, Robert Flaherty. I don't know. When there is uh, when there's not cinema verite, but it's probably one of the best documentary ever made. Uh, Nanook uh, in the. But, but you, uh, I, I never understood what it is cinema verite. For me, it was a big lie. Cinema Verite, uh, but <laughs> was necessary lie at the time, you know. Uh, now a Jean Rouge approach film would be ridiculous right now because we have so much information in the 60s that that cinema was important because it was taking you in territory where we don't know. Now with internet things, everything is so available. The space, the image, the thing, we know everything. You just, uh, if I tell Bulu Boos, ah, what is Bulu Boos? Ah, look, Bulu Boos is here, ah, look at this, uh, and you immediately know. Before you have to wait 20, ah, look, there's a film about this incredible place. It's happening. It was bringing you information, was taking you in a place that you're never able to go there. Anthropological cinema is gone, is dead, you know, like completely. Margaret Mead uh, cinema would be ridiculous now if an anthropologist would go there and do what Margaret Mead did. But at that time, it was necessary. Like uh, Gardner was necessary, although I think it was extremely judgmental his way of work, uh, and Rouch was fantastic, you know, his movies. But now, if someone would film in that way, it would be totally unacceptable, you know, to follow a certain story in that way. To uh, so I never really understood that, you know. I know what what was there, but I think also for me, my need is also to transform things in something else, you know. I like to start from reality, and that reality to transform it in something else. Yes, but you say you don't shoot uh, 30 hours, for example. Uh, that is the the cinema, we, we the cinema verite uh, they were not shooting was shooting hours. a lot. No, not, but, not 30 hours. Yeah, but you are not expensive. shooting, but you are waiting and uh, without shooting. Is it not the same or? No, because then on my waiting, I create a very strong intimacy with the person. And uh, cinema, I think very few people spend three, four years to make a film following one character. 
And uh, for me, being there and following that character for so long, it means that I have to enter so much in his life and create a very strong relationship. And knowing him enough that when I put the camera, I know that that moment is a fragment of what my teacher was saying, don't ask 10 questions, not interesting, but you have to wait for that moment that is universal somehow, you know, that becomes really a universal moment. Mm. And that, that's my waiting, you know, that's creating, that's, I don't have a, a formula for that, because if I have, that's why I say every film I do is a, for me is a new film, because I have to start forgetting what I did before, and every time is different, because every story requires a different approach, a different method, a different interaction. There's no really formula for this. And that's why every time I make a film, I say it's my last film, because it's extremely painful and long, and I have no more personal life on that, because my life become being outside, being there. I'm not a filmmaker that goes home at night and goes uh, to his own life. You know, I was now one year in Middle East, and uh, for one year, I didn't have a home, you know, I didn't have a place where to go back. I was constantly moving, 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 moving from place to place. And, uh, and it's very tiring. It's, uh, you give a lot on that, you know. It's not like going there for two, three weeks, filming and go back home. Um, I, I've been one and a half year, six months for researching and one year shooting in Middle East without even go home for one day. Just a big follow question. Uh, the, the end of uh, Boatman, it's, it's quite funny because you give the Boatman money. That was the first day. The first day, but it's, yeah. it's the end of the film. It was four years before. Okay, but you, <laughs> the end of the film, you pay the Boatman, and then he said to you, you go into your hotel. Yeah. So you're going back to the luxury of European. Well, it was like, you don't belong here, which I wanted this to be the film, you know. The, the only point of view I could have was the humble point of view of a tourist. Because India is so deep and so difficult that the more I was searching for answer, the less I could go and filming, you know. So especially when you choose not putting a voice over, because the voice over helps you so much to, you know, of course, like Herzog film is all about explaining with his voice over and the style that he has. And uh, I told you, like, when we met, uh, we did this masterclass together, so I wish uh, when I did Sicario were you, because I could explain so many things. And I had to, I chose to do it only with the camera. And so you have to subtract so many information that you have to find a synthesis with a frame or non-frame, you know, but that's filmed completely upside down. So it's a, there's a twist there of something. Uh, so you have to find always a, a tool, a, a narration tool that works without explaining too much. And for me, subtraction is my, goal always when I make a film. It's like, how much less information can I give? Less, less, less before everything fall apart. Like Giacometti statue, you know, take it out, out, out. How much can you take it out before the statue break? Mm -hmm. And that's always a big challenge for me. You know, how little can I say about this huge problem with no explanation before people say, fuck you, we don't understand anything. I don't want to see this movie. And the only way I have this is like through finding people, finding characters that are so big, and with their story, they give you so much that then you don't ask anymore the question, why is there, what's happening in that place? Because you get attached to what the human dimension is more than explaining why that place is like that. That I can do at the beginning of the film with three words, and it's enough. And I always say, if you make a film, it should not be like an article, you know, then you write an article. If you want to explain so much, you write an article. A film is something else. For me, that's why cinema, it's important, the narration, and I want to use the the narrative form of cinema, not about a document explaining, explaining, explaining about things, having a thesis. And, uh, you know, Michael Moore is one of the, I think he destroyed documentary completely <laughs> with his approach. And it's not cinema that, that's like uh, propaganda and the worst kind of journalism. And, uh, and I'm not interested in that, you know, at all. Like, this is a completely different way of working. For me, when I make a, f a documentary, I'm more close to flirty than to, to Michael Moore, you know, <laughs> to find the way, yeah. Question, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a completely other question, Mr. Rosie. Um, one can see in your films the development of the technique. Film, sound, the things uh, you probably work today with, with other cameras and other possibilities. You have much more possibility. You can go much nearer to people. You can try out much more. And I would say now, as a as a statement, as a, th um, a thesis, um, 
that this, uh, uh, all these possibilities, this possibility to get near, is a problem for respect for the other one. Well, I just say that now, and I ask you, how do you deal with all these possibilities and 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 with the problem uh, that uh, uh, that arise when you you can do so much and when you can try out so much and then you can go so near to people. I mean, you say uh, they trust me. <laughs> I have to believe that. But as a spectator, sometimes I ask myself, well, did he ask them to show that? Did he did he ask them really to 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 make the take, to shoot that picture? That's my question. Well, the possibility are huge. You know, now you can make a film with a cell phone, but still I choose uh, to make a, with a camera that is as close as possible to my first 60 millimeter camera, Ariflex, and I use a, a Ari camera, which is very heavy, very visible. It's not like a small camera that I put in my pocket and I take it out. You can do a film with that, but for me, it's not about that, be able to move, because I don't care. I spent one month without shooting, or two months, or six months, when I was uh, around uh, looking for location and thing, I didn't even bring my camera with me because I knew I was not able to shoot. Then once I choose the location, the people that, that were going to be part of the film, then when I started getting out the camera. And when I film, it's never something that I take it, oh, look, because I would be always late. You know, For me, it's about missing things, the not gaining things. 90% of the time, I miss story, I miss situation. But then when I grab something, it's because, OK, today I got to film. What? I don't know, maybe there, maybe here. Let's see what's happening today. And then I have to go over a huge state of mind because I hate filming. <laughs> it's like a very hard moment. When you put the camera, it's no pleasure at all because that's the moment of transformation. That You know, never know what's going to happen there. You're expecting something incredible. Sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes it's not interesting enough. And sometimes it's more is better than anything you could have thought, you know, things that come out, the conversation, the thing, the relations, the interaction that happened there is magical, is unique. Again, it's like no writer could have write, no actor could have delivered that in that way. And that's what I'm looking for. The fact that uh, the trust, the thing, of course, like, uh, you know, when I finish the film, I always show the film to the people and uh, I cannot show the film throughout my editing or try my things. But then again, my duty is like to be able to go as close as possible. And then I don't have to be afraid when I show the film that I did something that they would not expect. The Sicario, when he, when I shoot with him, I told him it's very hard for me to film you. You did something horrible. The only thing I can do is like not judge you with my camera. And then he wanted to see the film because he had a problem with not being recognized and things. So he asked me to show to see the film, and, uh, and then I showed it to him before releasing. And and he finds something. See, he finds something there that he didn't know that was there because that's the only also like almost a long session of psychoanalysis, you know, that I spent with him with this. Uh, I don't know what's going to what was going to happen there, but again, there's not one single film that I would be ashamed to to show to the people I work because people I'm, and I never betray the people you know if I start a film with nine person I bring them all to the end if I start the film with two people I bring it to the end I never left any person outside the film because it's a big uh, it's part of a journey that I start and uh, I never felt for a second oh I'm afraid to show the film to them because I betrayed that, or because I cheated, or because I shot something that they were not expecting. Every time I shoot, they know exactly what I'm filming. It's not that I hide the camera, or I, I put with the phone that he doesn't know that I'm filming, or things like that. So when I film, I'm very visible. When, when people tell me, oh, you look invisible <laughs> when you film, but it's not true. I'm, I have a huge camera, I have a tripod, I have a, uh, I have a huge separation with the character. And, but that's what it is. Then how this happened, I don't know. You know, as I say, I don't have a method that is particular. I have a way of working, but I'm not able to every time be, oh, I have this formula to work, so it's going to be fine. Because every time I don't know what's going to happen, every time I don't know if the conditions are working, I don't know. For me, what is the most important thing, and also part of the truth we were talking, and this I discovered with time, is the distance. You know, sometimes, and unfortunately, I'm becoming more and more aware of this because of experience, because of you know the film, the, the relationship I create.
but things change so much. If you move the camera here, 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 I tell different stories. So the, how do I, is it sitting there? Where's the right, is it here? Is it here? Is it here with the zoom lens? I never use the zoom lens, I always use wide angle. So I have to find that this, and somehow here's too much, and here's too little. Somehow it is too much, and this is perfect. To find that balance in a frame, for me, is very, very difficult. That's why now I use the tripod a lot. Because once I find that, that distance and that uh, element, for me, this becomes really part of the truth we were talking about before, you know? It's like, and then, uh, so that's why I cannot move anymore with the camera. Once I find that element of storytelling, on this frame, I cannot move it for one centimeter, you know, it's there. And I have to wait for something to happen in within this frame. And if I move fast because things are changing around me, I have to be fast, fast, fast to find again the right frame and the right distance. Uh, there are some time I see some film that where there, it's something happening that is great, but the distance of the camera is wrong somehow, you know? And then you're telling a different stories, you know? They're, they become judgmental because the camera is on the wrong place. So it's uh, the big challenge for me is always to find that element of distance between the camera and the subject. And that's where there is the narration element for me. Maybe it's only my mind, you know? It's not something you can say to a student or teach to someone, but it's part of my work. And every time for me is a challenge to find that distance and that uh, narration, you know, which for me is close to the truth because that's changed a lot the relationship between who is filming and who is filmed. We will, uh, one second, we will... Uh... It's, it's hard to, this is not, again, it's not mathematical, this thing, but something you have to feel it extremely strong. And for me, it's part of my work when I do that. That's why maybe I'm thinking now, maybe that's why I'm using more and more the tripod, you know, because it allows me somehow to, okay, okay this is what I want to be, and not moving too much. Once I find that things, Things have to happen in within that frame there. We will approach a question of narration and editing later on. It's very important, narration and editing. Uh, and you have to come back, so, sorry and please, uh, about this, I hate to film. But first a question. Um, you were mentioning Michael Moore, who is uh, very judgmental in his work and he's ridiculed. He, he's ridiculing people, and he. You, what I saw in your work is the opposite. You are distant, respectful, but what I also uh, observed. Uh, I mean, he distant, has an agenda always. Yeah, I have any agenda. he's on a crusade. <laughs> um, you're distant, respectful, but what I also observed is you've developed from film to film, from distance, respectful. What I saw in Sacro Gra was was tenderness. You, you ca came closer to your protagonists, the scene with the, with the grandfather and the, uh, her, his granddaughter sharing a room. They even were sleeping in a uh, Leto a Castello. <laughs> uh, I saw a lot of tenderness there. I, 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 I thought you are coming closer to the people you're observing. Getting uh, old. Aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> sentimental, close. No, 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 no. no, there was no. I meant it in a. Yeah, please stop making. I, 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 I meant it in a positive way. I, I saw, I saw a lot of tenderness, but also, isn't there a danger? Aren't you afraid of of uh, of uh, being touched too much by those people? How do you keep the distance that you need to 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 work as a uh, professional filmmaker? How do you can, how can you manage to maintain the distance? Um, you know, but it's very hard uh, after. When when you work there, it's, you spend time and it becomes part of your life, you know, the people I'm working with. When I was in, depends also so much on the place I work, you know, usually my space are very small space, a very, a very uh, con contained space, you know, a boat with a boatman, a room with a sicario. Uh, below, sea, below sea level was always like it, it was a huge territory, but I choose uh, maybe two square, f two kilometer, where I shot the film and where these people were, you know. And uh, I never, you see, my film you never see other people than when the one I'm filming. Used like there's always a void around uh, because 
I only film the one that I have a relationship. There's never someone accidental that pass uh, because uh, it's not part of my narration and because I, I develop this intimacy with one by one by one character. So once I'm there, it's become part of my life. The difficult part is when you finish to film and somehow I realize how hard it is because you've been giving a lot, they give you a lot and you have so much part. And then suddenly you, you detach yourself, you know, you finish this film, you start another life, you go back home, you know, take it by problems, by things, by taxes, by things, by <laughs> surviving, by go to, to do a class, by, you know, life become different, you know, so it's important. And it's hard to keep having that, that relationship. And sometimes I feel like horribly, horribly shame, you know, not, but not to be able to have any more that content. You cannot call in people, or, Somehow it's a distance, so somehow slowly, 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 you forget, and then you start a new project. And there's a new, and this is horrible. This is what I mostly hate uh, on making what I do. And sometimes I say, "Wow, oh, it's so hard," you know, because you're so close, and then slowly, slowly you detach, and then you start another life, another work. So where the, so there are people that I very close to still, you know, after years, uh, like Gopal, I never heard him from 20 years, and now we are again in touch like nothing happened. Boatman. The boatman, yeah. Because now with WhatsApp, you know, he can call me, and suddenly I receive this phone call from India, and say, who is this, Gopal? <laughs> and we talked for one hour on the phone, and uh, he sent me a picture, I got like, wow, look how he became, he's like a huge man, like fat, 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 he's like a merchant uh, in the market. But the voice was exactly the same, you know, and now we talk every day on <laughs> the phone, so after 20, suddenly he's back in my life, you know. And then there is a Ken, Kenny, he hates me forever, in Bas Kenny, because we had a big conflict when I was shooting. You know, also there is another difficult dimension there about you know, you work with people that somehow they need money, they need the things they are in need, and you know, you don't have uh, always, I wish you, you know, when I was working there, my budget was really the food and uh, and be there, you know, was like zero budget. And some, somehow then people, where is the thing? You pay people, you don't pay people. You know, usually what I did was like, okay, with the money that peop the film makes, I, I share it, you know, because if you cannot pay people. The only person I pay when I was shooting was the Sicario. But <laughs> it was very funny because he, he, he didn't want to be filmed. And then suddenly with the journalist, Charles Bowden, who is one of the greatest journalists, that he's the one that interviewed the Sicario and then I read the story and then said, I want to make this film. This is going to be very difficult to, for him to never accept to film. And then suddenly I received this phone call and said, okay, he's going to do it, but Gianfranco is strange, the condition, because the wife is pregnant, he needs money to deliver the kids in a hospital because of his life, and he's asking money. And I said, well, how much am I asking? And then I talked to him. He said, well, I, I, I to shoot people, I, I usually take two thousand dollar. <laughs> I said, okay, good to know. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> There's three, four people I want to. <laughs> two thousand dollars gone. <laughs> the problem is gone. So for you to shoot me, okay, shoot you. <laughs> I'm gonna ask the same price. <laughs> So it was not bad, you know? <laughs> it was a good condition. <laughs> it was so bizarre that I said, okay, I'm gonna pay for the first time someone $2,000 to to be shot mm, by me. It was fair, yeah. you know, it's a Sicario, what do you expect, you know? We, we might uh, see a new except of the film. Do you want to add something? When, when, when we have a cigarette, no, that, there are a few that, people, no. That's my question. Some people here ask me, I need to smoke. Yeah. Do you want to do? Do we need a, a break or not? They asked me. Yes. There were really? one person. I really need to smoke. Yes or not? <laughs> no. You see, nobody. Can I smoke here? No. <laughs> so just the the no persons just raise your hand to be sure you're the majority. No, no. Nobody no, needs to no, pee. No break. Nobody needs no to break. pee. Look, look. Oh come on. That's a, that's the people. <laughs> huh? That's so go ahead. Let's go ahead. Yes. So I, I think we could show uh, an excerpt of uh, El Sicario, but uh, we we got a problem. We we didn't Maybe find. When you show, I can go to smoke a little bit. Yes, it's, it's three minutes, but <laughs> come back. Uh, and um, we we got a little problem. We didn't find a DVD with English English subtitles. So the El Sicario will speak in in uh, in Spanish. You will understand that, huh? Why? Because it's a market and your, your sister... Yeah, I don't know. 
yeah, not in Switzerland. Anyway, so it's it's spoken in Spanish and subtitled in French. But I think it's interesting to show to see at least one one moment where El Sicario is explaining how they are um, they are um, violating uh, um, a prisoner. So, bitte uh, der Ausschnitt Nummer Nummer elf elf. Sí, si todo sale bien, te van a soltar. O sea, 
hiciste mal en gastarte el dinero que no era tuyo, hiciste mal en, en tratarte de burlarte del patrón, o sea, tú sabes que no, nadie, nadie se burla, pero ya voy a pagar, eh, yo voy a pagar, más bien tu familia va a pagar, espero que no den aviso a la policía, acuérdate que de todo, de todo se entera el patrón, si avisan a la policía tú la vas a pasar mal, no, ellos no van a avisar a nadie, ellos saben lo que me puede pasar. Ok, ¿te quieres recostar un rato en la cama? Sí, me dejas. Sí. Ok. Lo traje. Lo recosté. Y duró dormido unas dos o tres horas sobre este lado. Y nosotros seguíamos en la noche. Tu familia se quiere pasar de lista. Únicamente llevó la mitad del dinero. Ya sabemos que en las cuentas ya no tienes dinero, pero tienes unos ranchos y tienes unas casas. Les van a hablar para que esas propiedades las pongas a nombre de otra persona que es una inmobiliaria y ellos van a encargar de venderlas. No entregaste el dinero completo, entiende, no estamos jugando porque sacaron todo el dinero si lo tenían en el banco. 7.45, recuerdo que eran las 7.45, 7.50, antes de las 8 de la mañana. Suena el teléfono, y es el teléfono del, del jefe. ¿Sí, ordene? Ah, sí, señor. No, 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 aquí está, está tranquilo. Sí, no, no, aquí está. Lo estamos viendo, no, está bien. Ok. ¿De dónde lo quiere? Ah, inmediatamente, señor. No, lo que hacemos de aquí para allá, estamos cerca, estamos cerca. Estamos cerca de los coches. Ok. Vamos a, vamos a sacarlo, le dije yo a los compañeros. Le vamos a, vamos a dejarlo que se bañe, que se cambie, que se ponga línea. Hay que entregarlo del otro lado. Ya hay que llevarlo para allá. Uno que se metió a bañar fue un rápido. Uno de los compañeros trajo pantalonera, sudadera, tenis del 9, un rastrillo. Se rasuró, se arregló, se puso línea. Contento estaba el hombre, no se lo notaba ya no hinchado porque pues, lo del agua no fue nada, los golpes fueron bajos. Vámonos. Y, y, y le dimos su seguridad. ¿Qué hicimos? Nos sentamos en el asiento de atrás. Yo iba de su lado derecho, él en medio, otro compañero de izquierdo y otro manejando. Cruzamos el puente y nosotros lo entregamos a otros compañeros. Desde ese momento yo ya no supe nada. Y no me interesa, ni me interesó nunca saber cuando se entregaba un paquete que pasaba con él. No era mi función. Mi función había acabado al entregar el paquete. Y era el trabajo que iba a hacer. No muchas veces se necesita un equipo muy grande para hacer un trabajo de levantar a una gente o ejecutar a una gente. Lo que se necesita es a alguien con valor, experiencia y con los nervios de acero para que ni siquiera el estar enseguida de una patrulla lo haga uno pensar que lo están descubriendo. Esta persona que estuvo aquí cooperó hasta Okay. Yes. This is like second part of the fifth. Yes. It's very important to it, yes. the element of the writing. I was thinking it's interesting also to see, to see how how you ask him to reenact what happened. But of course you can we can show the uh, the 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 number of sad zeige. Number of sad. Yes, the writing. Number of sad.
farther, eh? Or you want to show the whole beginning? Mm, maybe not, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's up to you, huh? No, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. How to use the yeah. territory. Recuerdo que en una ocasión nos envían de, de México acá a Estados Unidos a otro compañero y amiga pues hacer el trabajo, a levantar un individuo. La orden era levantarlo y tenerlo y venimos para acá, para este motel y estuvimos en esta misma habitación. Él estuvo ahí durante tres días, que fueron los tres días de tortura que le estuvimos dando, hasta que no recibimos la llamada del Chaca que nos decía que había que entregarlo. Lógico, esos tres días no fueron agradables. Entonces tuvimos que darle su arreglada, su bañadita, su cambiada, para entregárselo a otra pareja de compañeros y ellos iban a hacer el traslado a la frontera y pasarlo a México. Durante ese tiempo que estuvo aquí, la orden nada más fue mantenerlo. Ya de ahí no sabemos qué haya pasado. La mayoría de las veces, aunque hayan pagado el dinero que debían, aunque hayan pagado el delito que tenían, ellos mueren. No hay fronteras para el narco, ni México, ni Estados Unidos, ni en Colombia, ni en Costa Rica, ni en El Salvador. El narco puede comprar todo. Pagan policías, pagan aduanas, pagan migración. Qué tan difícil es, si mueven toneladas y toneladas de droga, mover a una persona. Voy a relatar 20 años de mi vida, 20 años de mi vida dedicados al servicio del narcotráfico, del cartel, sirviendo a ellos con estas manos para torturar y matar gente. La función de un sicario es acabar con una persona de forma inmediata ya sea por medio de un balazo cuchillada o un golpe tan certero que nada va a sentir más que eso la forma en un carro Cuando un sicario es un profesional, no hace lo que hace cualquier imitador a sicario. Este es un carro, el objetivo va manejando y hay que matarlo. Un imitador hace esto, escupe todo el carro. Cuando un sicario trabaja, 
tiene un objetivo y va manejando y este es el objetivo son dos formas muy sencillas hace un círculo aquí donde es la chapa del carro o hace un círculo en el vidrio donde es la cabeza del objetivo ese es un sicario los demás son imitados Un sicario no tiene necesidad de hacer sufrir a la gente. Porque la gente sufre desde el momento que sabe que lo van siguiendo. Y el sicario nunca, nunca se anda publicando. Es alguien que está siempre entre la gente y se relaciona entre la gente. Y puede estar tanto, puede estar en un parque jugando béisbol con sus hijos como puede estar en una junta en un cabildo de una presidencia de una ciudad él sabe tratarse sabe vestirse sabe manejarse sabe hablar tiene educación por eso le costó al narco hacerlo desde pequeño y pagarle por eso le paga para estar siempre en todos los lugares y poder hacer las cosas bien hechas. So uh, one information about your your interest for this kind of person. Usually the the characters are uh, you pay attention with kind of tenderness to your characters. This case is very different. Yeah, this is a completely different film because I had a very strong relationship with the journalist. Uh, he was my mentor, was Charles Bode. Unfortunately, he died uh, four years ago. And uh, I met Charles um, when, he, when I was doing uh, Below Sea Level. I remember, I'll give you a little bit of background how I met Charles. So for me, the encounter is not him, it's Charles Bowden. And Charles Bowden, is, I think, is one of the greatest American writer and one of the greatest American journalists. Uh, he spent like all his life telling story about the border. He's from, uh, he lived at the border, El Paso, from Mexico, and think. And all his work, all his books, everything's there in that spot of life. And when I was filming in the desert, I heard him talking at the radio, and I, I took down his name. I wrote all the books that he wrote. I started reading about him, uh, read his books. And one day I felt this need of calling him and meet, wanted to meet him when I was doing the film in the desert. And uh, I called information number. They said, I would like to talk to Charles Bode. And he passed me immediately to him. He answered the phone and explained that I wanted to meet him. And, and then he said, well, I'll come by. And I wrote for two days from San Francisco down to Texas at uh, the border. And to to El Paso, and uh, and we met and became really strong, strong friends. Was this very that developed on years, 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 and then he helped me a lot also in the editing of uh, Below Sea Level. But anyhow, there was a very strong relationship with him. And at a certain point, I wanted to make a film with him, and was like on uh, cops uh, corruption. It was a great story that he was telling me. And uh, when we were in Louisiana traveling on location. He showed me this article that was uh, just came out, and I read it and I say, "Wow, it was an incredible interview with the Sicario." I said, "This is a, a film. I want to make a movie with him." He said, "Well, it would be hard to meet him. It took so long." I mean, he find all the way to meet this. Was, this guy was one of the top of the cartel, and then one day, I mean, you will see at the end of the movie what happened to him. So this has got really twenty years, and uh, to make it short. Uh, He agreed to be filmed after a few months because of this pregnancy. He asked me for money. I agree. I had to leave immediately to do the film. Zero money. I remember they didn't have any money. I had to borrow a camera. I was going to Mexico to do a, a master class. So I was flying to Mexico. Then from Mexico, I went to El Paso and, and, and met him. And the moment he, he knew everything about me. 
He did this incredible research. When I met him, you know, was my biggest surprise, like he looked like a normal guy, like completely like someone you meet at the supermarket in um, any place in Los Angeles or just big guy like this. So he he agreed to to be filmed, but he said only on my condition, you have to film in one location at the side. And he took me in this uh, motel. He took us in this motel. I was driving with him. Charles was following us. He wanted me to drive with him. He was always aware that you know there was, but he he trusted Charles a lot. And uh, and he took me in this motel and say, now you stay here. I don't know when I'm coming. You wait for me. Maybe two days. Maybe one week. Maybe two hours. I don't know. And I spent three four days in this motel room. Don't know anything. Just waiting for him. Charles was not there because he couldn't stay in this city for a reason of security. And every day, every every car was passing, thing as it could be him. And one morning at six o'clock in the morning, knocked the door, and it was him. We had a coffee together. I didn't know how to film him. The only things I knew was like he was a graphomania, you know, always writing. During the interview of uh, of Charles Bowden, he was writing everything down. And Charles wanted to keep these papers, and, and he destroyed the paper completely. But I knew that the only way to get in the truth, I knew that he, I couldn't film his face. He didn't want even the hands to be seen. So it was like he came with a mask, a police mask. And the three, four days I spent in this room, I say, I don't know. It's the first time I didn't have that kind of privilege of being with someone or knowing him, except the article, which was a very, very deep article where you know everything about him in this article. So this, my knowledge was only about through the article. So I didn't have really any idea of how to film him. What I did is like, I said, I have to transform this room in something, in a stage, you know? So I took off all the, all the painting of the room and I put a blank, a, bl a, a, a white sheet on the, on the chair. I decided that I had this book with me that I always carry when I work, and the, and the Sharpie. I take notes, my baby, at night, so I have to write big. So I say I have to convince him to write, and this is the only way I can film, because that's the truth I can have through the writing, because I could not see his face. So the writing was becoming this tool of uh, narration and things. So it was all instinct at that moment. And when he covered himself with this mask, I felt that this mask was too much, you know, like too, too, and I asked him, can you take out this mask because it's too much. And I had this net that I use uh, for the, for the, for, to cover the camera um, in case uh, I was going to shoot in Mexico because it, on the police car, I cannot, sh I couldn't show this. So I asked if he could put this net on. So that's why there is a scene when he tried to see if he can see. And then I convinced him to write, but still I didn't know which frame doing it. And when he started, I just put that frame there and he was writing upside down, basically. And uh, I, I was there filming. I said, how can I film the whole thing upside down? It's one thing. He didn't stop, you know, and I, said, I feel like one and a half hour, two hours in that position without moving the camera. And I was keep thinking, this is crazy. How can I, uh, this, I'm going to ruin the chance that I have. But I didn't know how to stop that. You know, it was like a flow of information, writing, 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 turning page, writing, writing, writing. So we went through basically all his life in this one fixed frame. And this is my editor's going to kill me. This is crazy. I cannot do a film like that. Then the next day, I had only two days with him. Then the next day, I asked if I could go through the pages of the book from this side here and explain him what he was doing. So I had the second take. And the rest was like, he disappeared, you know? So we start editing with my, with Jacopo. And then I felt like there's so many missing parts. And I convinced Charles to go back to, to meet him again one more time because I said, this, this room has to become more a protagonist. And when I met him, I asked, what's, I didn't know before that that was the room where he was kidnapping people. And so that room was a kind of a prison there. When I, I knew only after <laughs> I filmed that this was the room. Uh, but then he had to leave, and then he, for a few months, I didn't see him. So he agreed to go back there and film. And then I had only one day, half a day, to film him. And that's when I did the reenactment. I said, can you explain what's happening in this room? And there's that scene there. And then at the end of all that, he did another few moments explain me with the book. And then there is the end of the part of the movie, which is like a total revelation where he fall apart completely there. 
and there is that that moment of truth, you know, that his conversion, his uh, redemption somehow. But it's not really there because at the end, this is a man that goes from a pa patron to another patron, you know, like from from the cartel patron to God that he became his new patron on this uh, obsessiveness of uh, of religious side that he took. So it was this, it somehow it was an instant movie. This, you know, it was a film that I did completely in, on instinct, but. Uh, uh, um, and it's really far away from the way I work, but somehow I think this was the only way that was possible to do this film. It's almost like a graphic uh, uh, documentary, you know. This writing is so, it gives so much images, you know, and, and the fact that there are tools, uh, narrative tools that I had to choose, the book, the pen, the room, and, and create this element of narration to, through things that I had there available. So it was somehow a very strange film to do because it took me three days to shoot and no budget, basically, no knowing him, not having a relationship with him. And the, the question for you and for many filmmakers is how to, how to show the violence, extreme violence, and the solution there is a reenactment. So he's, he's suggesting well, what it, happened. It's more violent when he writes down. You know, when he described the torture on the writing, it's much more... The, the unbearable, you know, that moment where he described the torture in there. It's extremely... And, you know, this is, again, a film... Uh, this film went really everywhere. And, you know, I was al always afraid that people would say, oh, how you give the world to to an assassin or a guy like that? And I think this is the only way to, to show what, to, at the time, uh, was not very... Now there's all this fashion of cartel, cartel movie, Sicario, Sicario. This was the first film that came out on that subject. And the word Sicario somehow was, <laughs> it was open up from this film. Now all film is like Sicario here, Sicario there. There's made, they made so many films on Sicario. This was the first time the word Sicario was, it went on American uh, vocabulary somehow, because, uh, uh, and then was somehow accepted as a word. And the film, and I never always say, now they're gonna kill the film, you know, say, ah, oh, you don't give the word to a guy like that. But then he has a, somehow something extremely special, you know, the way he tells the story, the way he narrates all that, the way he comes out of this, the way he detaches himself. Uh, you feel it's extremely close to him. It's a film, for me, it's a very unique film, this. It's a film that uh, I, nobody can make it, a film like that, and I cannot make it again, a film, because this was a film that was born in that way, meant to be that way, and no way of thinking back, you know? It was like, boom, a moment uh, uh, that happened. And um, I, I'm very close on the, on the narration of this film, you know, on uh, how somehow it tells so much with three elements, three shots, basically, are in the film. And yet you're there and you never go away and you create this imaginary world from his descriptive things, you know? And the truth is really, we edit the film completely following the way he structured. Uh, there's not one thing that I changed. So he had an incredible ability as a narrator, you know, like telling a story in, in a, such a, a strong way that uh, we edited the film in one week. It was very, very fast, you know? There was no plan B there. <laughs> <laughs> there were like f three hours footage, four hour footage, and we just going like this. And the only thing I said, how do we go in this fixed frame for one, this jump cut? So I decided to put the black between this. And in, at this score, when I was editing that, every time he turns page or he goes to another level where you have to cut, he, he was like, <sighs> he was like, <sighs> this is like, <sighs> was like a well, you know, going down and up, this is breathing element that gave the rhythm to the film. So every block, there's a change of scene, but the change of scene becomes exactly oh, on he's going down like this and they're starting a new chapter. And after two hours that I filmed him, he collapsed completely. He stopped, he put down the pen and the book, and he started crying. And I left the room for maybe half an hour like this. and. Uh, and, uh, and then I have to give him the money. And I went back and I said, I'm not going to give you any money. I said, why? Well, because you need to pay me, because this for you was like a session of <laughs> you took out so much of your horrible life that you did. You know, this was like a, for you a, a rebirth, you know, on the work you did. So I said, OK, don't give me money. But then I, th I thought it was good to pay the debt with him. And I gave him <laughs> <it to> money. <laughs> 
<laughs> back. And the last time I saw him, he said, you know, now I'm not anymore a Sicario, but I always have one bullet. So if you want something to be fixed in your life, remember that I always have one bullet. You can ask me <laughs> if you need to kill someone. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? So well, there are many people. I don't know if I will arrive to that, uh, that decision in my life. You know? He's looking for two thousand dollars. For him, was huh? like you know, yeah. there's always one bullet. Uh. He's looking for two thousand dollars, man. No, but that's like, a, but it's a way. How this is a way of life, you know. This is really incredible, and the film, this come out so strong in a place like in Mexico. This film became like a huge. Uh, hit, you know, was like all newspaper things. Uh, nobody was able to show the film in a cinema, but on DVD and uh, internet and things, it was like, uh, reached like a million uh, uh, viewers and copies and things. It was a huge hit to the film. Like all newspaper was talking about this film. Somehow, it's the first time that someone was talking about that world in such an intimate way and telling really how the structure works of the cartel, you know? And you, you did not rehearse nothing with him? Zero, because there was no time to do anything. I just, in my mind, when I was waiting, I say, okay, I'm going to put this chair. Why? I want to transform this room in a stage so that it's clear. I'm going to put the book there. I'm telling him, when you sit down, just open the book. And the only thing I told him is like, write as much as you can. But I was not even telling because he would have done it anyhow. The hard part was like to convince him to film the writing. Because he didn't want it at the beginning. He said, oh, you recognize, they recognize my hand. And I said, well, then, then we don't do the film. Because uh, I need something. I don't have your face. Uh, I need your voice to have a, a support of something visual, you know? Because otherwise, uh, I cannot just film someone talking like that. And that somehow was the right uh, decision for the film. Because but the it, interesting it's is... It's very mystery how the film it's, works. It's, not, it's never anecdotic. It's very no. structured yeah. from the beginning till the end. So. Yeah, but he created that. You know, this is the amazing thing that he's an incredible storyteller. Uh, that he has this uh, this uh, incredible gift of telling story in such a depth way and goes like from dramatic things. Sometimes it's also funny, almost. You know, it's a bit ridiculous sometimes in the way he said. I mean, also the scene. When he says, but this, this is a, an imitador, this is an imitation of the like, cigar. So there's a pride there. And then through, he goes through the film, he hates that world, and, and he tells how he went into that world. But this is like in Mexico, it's almost um, a huge part of society is so completely taken by this uh, lifestyle, you know, and uh, it's one of the most violent countries. Uh, thousand, 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 thousand people died uh, of Sicario, you know, like um, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And nothing changed, you know, the corruption that is so strong. That's why, you know, the um, FBI and things, they, they pinned us um, uh, Charles Bowden to say w that they wanted to find him. And of course, he say, that's my source. I cannot do the same job I did that you can find yourself. But then Obama saw the film, because this was the first time that was opening to the cartel structure. And there's a certain point when he saw the movie, he also wanted to see that there was no missing thing. He gave the name of El Chapo, uh, Guzman, that now he's uh, been uh, uh, in prison. In the States, yeah. And he, he said El Chapo, and El Chapo is Guzman. So he said, this you have to take it out, this world. If you don't, this guy's going to come, no matter where you are, is going to come. And so this world has to be out. He, he came out through his lip and his mouth. And uh, so on the editing, I had to took out that part where he mentioned who is his boss, El Chapo, who was Guzman. So he was working for Guzman. Mm. Uh, any questions or remarks about this film? Yes, here, please, microphone. And then it's going to be a rush because we have two more films to... It's it's uh, we have uh, fifty fifty minutes less. 50? Yeah, please. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, how do you secure the rights of these people? I mean, this this criminal he could have killed you at the end, and how do you make uh, sure that all these people you have trusted uh, that they don't at the end say. Uh, I'm not in. I don't want to be the film. Or you mean him particularly? Him or also the others? Do you have anything in written for them that they agree? No. Or how if do that you was like you know the only person. That's why I said Charles Bowden. That's why I put also Charles Bowden name. It's a film by Gianfranco Rosi and Charles Bowden because without Charles Bowden, this film would never exist. 
So this film is a passing of trust, basically. Trust Bowden, trust, uh, tr the Sicario trust, tr trust Bowden, trust Bowden trust me. In fact, the only thing, Charles Bowden is an incredible car. You should check him online. You know, he was fantastic. He was bigger than life. He was really like two meters guy, big, speaking like this. And the only thing he says is, Rovago, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing he told me. Uh -huh. I leave you now with him. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> That's the only thing he said to me. So and I, when I was filming, I said, I'm fucking up this. It's like, I'm filming something upside down completely for two hours and I'm not able to move. Because if I move, I'm going to stop this moment. And I was to say, imagine if CNN would have sent me here to film this, and I delivered them two hour tape of someone writing upside down. They would have killed me, not the Sicario. And for two hours, I'm there thinking. But then I said, oh, this is so strong. And then I think, uh, you know, looking inside the, again, like this microscope, this is where you get the the storytelling and thing, the narration. So I was keep saying like this for two hours. My back was like hurting because then I was going to be a two hour take and I was like this for two hours. Once in a while I was up and then go back again because only there I could understand if it was working or not. So when I was outside, it was a disaster. And then when I go there, I said, oh, it's working, it's working. The rhythm is right, everything, the frame, the things, everything's perfect. But then when he finished, I said, fuck, I have only this. What do I do now? Then I asked the next day to go through all the pages of the book and he started explaining, so that helped a lot on the editing. And then I had to go back there and say, I have, this room has to become really clear that is the room of torture. And then there is that moment of revelation at the end that I never expected that to happen. And, and just by the way... Sorry, what was the end of the question? Uh, it's just... Uh, so, yeah, you, you it's just trust trust, yeah, trust, trust, trust. The audience has to trust. It's a chain of trust, you know? And then they say, how do you know this guy is telling the truth? I know because Charles Bowden is the guarantee of this. Charles Bowden is like the most... Uh, incredible journalist yeah there. but my all, question all is his source was like checked okay. and over checked yeah. before publicing this to yeah. to to the magazine uh, they were like fact checking you know american how they are on these things and uh, i always knew that the most responsible was charles you know like the, in fact he was the one on the target it was not me it's always somehow the, the the first source you know that he was the one that knows everything if they take me i don't know anything i only know charles bowden because he knows how to arrive to him. It was 20 years of work to arrive on him. I, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know anything about to say. I'm there filming. But the whole chain of swords, this to arrive to him is 20 years of work. It was not like chance that he met him in the square. It was 20 years of knowing people at the board, knowing the thing, da, 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 da. and then first time happened that uh, a Sicario talking that term. <coughs> a Sicario, which was one of the top guy of the of the once in a while he's re, he used to now and not anymore drop me an email i said oh, how are you what are you doing and i saw the film was playing there and there i'm glad the film is going well i i don't like with the empty empty <laughs> there's always I, I check there's always full audience i would hate if you show the film with only three four people <laughs> so he knew everything you know where the film was played and then i tried to send back the email to him it was like no contact. So he was yeah. changing mail, they keep changing. He knew how to disappear. He was one of the most uh, top guys for internet. He was the one that had all the communication and in charge of uh, yeah. internet uh, for El Chapo. So you never had to re uh, a situation that, that the protagonist said, I don't want to be in the film anymore? No, but you know, their trust was really a big thing. If you say yes, is a yes. Uh, he would not have allowed me to film if he wouldn't trust me in that moment. I remember when he when we met, he took he shook my hand so strong, you know, like almost, and he looked at my eyes for like a few seconds, really, really like that, and so much was telling me so many things there, in that moment. I stared at his eye, and then I said, "I trust you. You can film me." There was a moment that he checked me on that. I said, "I trust you. You can film me." If he say no, would it be no? I don't know. And then, I you know, the father was waiting for him in the place, the way I asked him to... And once he said yes, I knew that was a yes. The only thing he said, before you deliver the film, I have to see it mm -hmm. for your, for your um, uh, Security. safety. 
And, um, and then he asked one thing that was very difficult, that he wanted the voice to change. Oh. And I couldn't do that. It was like, oh, that cannot change this voice. So this was the biggest work we did. I was in Paris, Serge was producing the film with Arte. I mean, post-producing for all the thing. And we, we, I looked for, there was a guy in Paris that was able to do an incredible work without changing the voice. He, ch he slowly, sl suddenly changed the pitch of the voice, very, very little, like working on his feminine and masculine side. <laughs> he was telling me, he did incredible work without changing the truth of the voice. He was able to sl slightly, slightly change the, the wave of the voice. Because that was something he asked, you know, the one to be recognized. <laughs> And when, we saw, when he saw the film, he said, okay, this is good for me. Mm -hmm. I sent him a clip to, to Charles Bowden, Charles Bowden showed it to him, he said, yeah. First it was, no, 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 this is recognizable, but yeah, this is good. And still the film didn't lose his own uh, imprint of the voice. So this was very, very difficult work. It took months to find the right way of, you know, going between the real voice and the voice slightly change enough that it's not recognizable on the wave and on the things. Anyway, at that time, during the shooting, he left already the job. Yeah, yeah, he was already... He, he uh, met God... Uh, he, could he, never was... get, he, he, would, he could never get protection because uh, he killed too many people and he could not go to FBI by being like mm. 200 people killed on his... Uh, so he could never get, get into a protection program. So. He had to change completely identity, and suddenly I knew that he was in Canada doing like uh, um, building houses in Canada. That's the last time uh, I heard from him. Juarez, now uh, Sakura, you're going back to your to your city room. You decide to escape from the from the touristic part of it and to circle around the city. In a few words, before we're going to see an excerpt, why the Gras? Well, 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 this is the first film I did on commission somehow, which was related to a very special moment of my life. I was getting separated, divorced and things, and somehow it was a need for me to to remain in Rome and not go back to, to the States, where I wanted to go back. So someone a year before I accepted to do this film proposed me to do this film. After after Below Sea Level, uh, someone came to me, and Lizzie Gerber, you know her? She's an editor in uh, in Paris. And she say, oh, you're the only one that can make this film. Um, there's a script uh, uh, the, to make this project around the Gra. And then I say, that's hard for me to make a film that has already been thought by someone else. But then after a year, I had to be in Rome and I contacted the producer and said, you still have that film available? And I said, yes, I would like you to do it. And I, we started immediately to do that film. And uh, it was very difficult because, again, it was a territory that I didn't want to read any script. I said, okay, I do the film, but it has to be completely my story. I don't want even to read the script. So I had to start from scratch. And uh, and then I, this, the fact that I was not really being, I was separated and, or divorced, whether I separated, and I didn't have any more place in Rome. And so the Gra became my territory. I, I was living on a camper and on a bed and breakfast. Uh, where we were spending time with the students there. And uh, and this uh, became like uh, the ring of Saturn somehow, you know, this, um, this immense, uh, it's like a, th a huge uh, highway that surrounds the city of Rome. And in order to get into Rome, this is the ring. It's perfect, this table. This is the ring. Rome is uh, here in the center. In the center of Rome, there live 250,000 people and in between the inside and the outside of this highway, they live three million people. So it's a huge division, you know. If you want to get into Rome, you have to pass through the Gra. If you want to go outside Rome, you pass through the Gra. And this thing is the nightmare of Rome, and is where traffic is. This exit, exit, exit that they bring into the city of Rome is the biggest nightmare of the Roman. But somehow it's also a place that was never explored, you know, because as I say, three million people live there. So the channel was like to create again an imaginary space, you know, because I, the thing was like, how do I tell the story of three million people that they live around this place? Where do I start? And mostly like, how do we, this place become a, a narration, you know? And I remember Nicolini was one of the persons, he was a genius in, in he was a, 
uh, as a cultural attaché of Rome. And amazing, he wrote a lot about this, uh, this gra. And one day he told me, uh, you have to do one thing. This circle has to be open and create an infinity line there. And only like that you're able to make this movie. And this is when I understood that I had to create almost an imaginary place, you know, like uh, there is a road, there's a bridge, there's a tree, there's a prostitute, there is a, a guy that's uh, all river? the car, river, well. river, there's a river. So all this became like a small, small, tiny village almost, you know, where you lost somehow the dimension of this circle. And only like this I was able to approach the narration of this film, like by transforming a place into something else, at least in my mind. Numero Dritza, bitte, Dritza. <laughs> piena di grazia, il Signore è con te. Tu sei benedetta fra le donne, benedetto il frutto del tuo seno Gesù. Ave o Maria, piena di grazia, il Signore è con te. Tu sei benedetta fra le donne, benedetto il frutto del tuo seno Gesù. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi peccatori, adesso è l'ora della nostra morte. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi peccatori. Siamo qui pure per loro, per quelli che non sono presenti. Abbiamo pregato anche per gli ammalati, per tutte le anime del purgatorio. Ecco, guarda adesso quando non succede, guarda come fai a non vederlo? Eh? Eh, no, no, non vedo niente. Poi quando si vedono le foto le faccio vedere. Sì. Peccato perché è una cosa bella da vedere è un dono secondo me che ci fa la Madonna guarda adesso guarda quando adesso rosso. è più luminoso adesso c'è il rosso che puzza il rosso puzza il luminoso è meno adesso luminoso adesso lo vedi il sì. rosso che puzza oh vedi sì. si fa... guarda quando è rosso adesso sì. guarda oh finalmente ciao un bel e mi essere di davanti te come vai? Porca soccola, sto raccordo, porca miseria, bestemmere tutti i santi, guarda, non ce la faccio più. E meno male che sto partito prima da casa, poi mi aspetta una ragazza che gli sto dando una mano, che sta a girare con me. Ma chiamate il regista dei fotoromanzi, sto a lavorare, faccio un mandato ruolo di maggiordomo.
posto fermi va bene vado un po' più sul lodo eh fermi così fermi fermi ecco fatto questo va bene pittori forse torci delle mani ma io quell'agenzia non l'ho mai sentita nominare tu uh, toccalo qua ma sei sicuro sei sicuro che non ah, dai, dai, tu devi guardare qua bene e io vi faccio così che tu porta il mio culo a te il dubbio che t'hanno mandato qua sospetto che tu sei d'accordo con qualcun altro fermi bene, te sei andato via e tutto Ugo ci pensieri di Ugo fermo così, guardi qua e dici c'è qualcosa che non va eccolo qua anche più primo piano perfetto adesso vieni un po' più vicino a Gaetano rimani un pochettino dietro ad ascoltare quello che ecco, spalla di bene, stai al centro ti sei girato allora ragazzina, mette la mano con le mani così, eh. ragazzina, ho parlato con tuo padre, so tutto, fermi, fermi che va bene, guarda come sei carina, guarda, Fanny sono venuta bene a queste foto, ti sono piaciute il regista? Sì, sì, no, infatti ha scelto questa, ha preso alcune delle tue, non ha considerato proprio quelle altre, quelle più professionali, poi mi sono... Uh -huh. ah. Ha detto che per, cioè, per i fotoromanzi preferiva questo genere. Uh -huh. Pensa a me mi fai ricordare quando andavo a fare il generico io, c'è una ventina d'anni. Io pure che te credi che è stato facile. Vabbè, ah, però... Ho trovato pure chi mi sono una fare. Eh. Ho sempre evitato quello, capito? Uh -huh. Non ti sei mai concesso? Non mi sono mai concesso, ma io ti dirò, se mi avrebbero scelto per un film come protagonista, gli avrei dato, ti dico la verità. C'è grido. Eh? La cosa peggiore se mi avrebbero detto che dà, vedi un po' che mi puoi fare, quello non avrei fatto mai. Però, se mi avrebbero fatto raccogliamo le pino, si dice Roma, no? che ti metti a pecorina, fai piano piano, l'avrei fatto. Dell'anno? So, so many different aspects in this film, in this film, many different stories, many different uh, persons. So the editing, the structure of the story was very important. I would like to, uh, you to mention the, one of the key person in your work, which, who is uh, the yeah, editor. The editor is Jacopo Quadri, and <laughs> it goes a long time with the relationship with Jacopo, because we started both uh, on my first film, uh, Boatman, and for him was also his first film as an editor. Then Jacopo arrived to made a big career, he's one of the most important editors, I think, uh, in Italy and probably in Europe. He, the last film he edited was all Bertolucci's uh, last uh, four film. So, um, but still, um, uh, every film I do, the only way, um, the only person I can work with is Jacopo because we know each other since so long and there's no need to talk between us. Uh, Jacopo is not a big talker. Like, uh, he makes sounds. He's like, <coughs> when he doesn't like something, he's like, <coughs> or he goes like this, cut, 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 or, <coughs> he has like, this is our relationship. <laughs> he never goes intellectual. When I start talking about more interesting, you get bored. It's like, I understand, understand. I <laughs> don't need to talk. So it's a very basic relationship. But um, I always say, you know, in my life I was able to have two wives, uh, two things, like a change in my life, my personal life. So the only thing that is stable in my life is the editor. 
And every time I say, this film, I changed my editor, but that I'm, able, I'm not able to, to do it because he's always working in other projects and I'm demanding a long time now, for, especially for this film. So there's always this conflictual relationship, but I think it's the only one that I can work with because, as I say, it's so immediate, the, the relationship. We, he, he, he was in the back of all film I did. So it's a very big reference for me in my life. osservato che non lo so queste case sono abitate quali? queste qui le villette? sì le villette c'è nessuno ma davanti quella là in là qui ieri sera c'era la luce sai questa casottina che hanno costruito ah, sì, sono abitate perché a volte eh, questa sì sì, sì. però quella là non c'è mai luce mai niente vedi che non sono accecati come me che tanti non bisogna accendere ma no ma non me lo dire scusami non è possibile quando una casa è occupata e abitata, una qualche luce si vede, non che io ci passi le, le serate a controllare, però sicuramente qualcosa le daresti. Non lo so, non ci avrei fatto caso. No, là qualcuno c'è al piano terreno. Quelli che hanno, sai che hanno i cani, quel cane bianco e nero? No. Che giocano qui. Nel prato eh, contigua a questo nostro, mm. dove ci sono quei due alberi, Fanno bene, guarda. Sì, mamma. È così, che tanta che ti vola, eh? Almeno che la lasciamo tutta pulita. Mm. Capito? Vabbè, adesso sei scritto, ho fatto tutte io. Eh, le fatte tutte tu, infatti, perché sui muri non si scrive. Però è bello scrivere sui muri. Eh, lo so, ma non si fa. In cameretta posso scrivere? No, camera nuova no. Ah. Neanche qua si fa, eh, perché qui c'è vera un'altra famiglia. No, perché lo, Lawrence Darrell era in forza al, al foreign office. And so this is this is really the, the fantasy of all filmmakers, because all of you you are voyeur, huh? to enter in the apartments of the people like that from the from the from the sky. Eh? You're coming from up. Upstairs, so yeah, but a, vo a voyeur is uh, doesn't declare that he's watching. I know it's something <laughs> is like so that, but of course, you have the microphones inside. That's when you don't have to be a voyeur, but you have to. But how, how do you decide to, to be in this situation? Which so it's amazing the intimacy of this, uh, of this um, piece, you know, on the film. It's like uh, so again. There is a strong relationship before I put the camera outside and start filming there. there But why, why do you want to be outside and in the same Because that's the way I discovered the story. I, I, I asked, um, I was looking for a place, uh, a building that you could see really that you are there on the ground. <laughs> and, and I wanted to find some story. And I was looking, 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 but I never felt the right location, you know. But so I went to many, many places. And then suddenly, <laughs> I approached this building and I looked at this place and knew that this was a place that a family that lost everything was like in a temporary 
uh, situation. Uh, people didn't have uh, you know, something happen in their life, and uh, so the the city of Rome gave this apartment, and it's like three, four hundred people living in this building. It's a huge building. And so I, I spoke to the doorman, and he showed me, I said, can I go to the terrace? I said, yeah, I'll take you to up to the terrace. And uh, and then by, I was going up to the terrace. It was uh, during the week, morning, it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And while I was going up from this, uh, from this terrace, I see all this window open, it was uh, almost summer. And I see the first window, second window, third window, so all this lane of window. And that's the thing, who lives? These are exactly the same. All the, it's a one room where there's two bed, the little kitchen in the back, and that's it, nothing else. And I was like very curious to see this. And then the, the same night, I said, when they're coming back, usually they come back from office or from place at like five, six o'clock. And I went there, and the first person I met was uh, Paolo. So I ring the bell, <laughs> he opened, he let me in. And I started talking to him for like two, three hours there. He told me all the story, his life. I told him he was doing a film. And uh, and then I started meeting all the people living there, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when I knew that I knew enough about them, I, I said, okay, now I start filming. And to film inside this space, this space was like, like this, from that wall to this. This was the whole apartment. Here was a huge window. Here was a time space for a bed. And that's it, nothing else. So would it be impossible to feel from inside because I would have cut already half of the of the room. And so I thought the only way to film this is from outside. And that's where I met the story anyhow. That was my encounter with the space and and then the space got life with the people I met. And then I started going there uh, when I knew the people were home. And still putting myself, uh, I put the microphone on them inside, the wireless microphone. And then uh, they knew I was filming or maybe not filming. Sometimes I was there, nothing was happening, didn't film. And I put the camera there. And you know, I was spending once in a while, I go to different apartments and spend time there and filming their daily life, basically their moment. And they completely forget about the camera because from where they are, you cannot even see the camera because it was a slightly high. The camera so it was a perfect point of view for narrating that space, and but to me it was important not to be voyeuristic in this uh, element, it was uh, to create somehow a very strong intimacy, even if I was outside and never entered. So this somehow was the dichotomy I was looking for in that uh, specific narration of this uh, these stories here, because then the film has different stories. There are like eight characters. One of my favorite characters is the palmologist. I don't know if you have a piece of him. Of course. Yeah. But we have not so much time anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, but just, you you said before you hate filming, but uh, we have the feeling watching these p characters that you like to film them. You in kind I like of to spend time with them. And then somehow the only thing I, uh, I, start, I, I know how to do is making film. <laughs> but the process of filming is something that's very painful for me. Taking out the camera, and taking that position again that's for me the because when we spend time together it's great you know you're sitting down you're talking and that's what i said before is about missing things because so many interesting things if i had a small camera and start filming every moment i would come out with probably uh, 50 hours of great footage but that's not what, the way i want to work so for me it's a great moment of knowing each other spending time go outside to eat go to the job go to the things really creating this relationship and then there's the moment I say, okay, now I have to film this. How do I do that? What's going to happen when I put the camera and let things go? So there's always an enormous anxiety for me. And that's why I think I have an excuse of waiting for the clouds, because if there is a, a clear day, then I say, today I don't film. So I'm waiting for the clouds. So waiting for the clouds is another opportunity of not filming, to postpone the, the film. Was it more difficult for you, <coughs> painful for you, to, to film Fokuamare? Because you're filming partly, part of the film is uh, uh, other migrants. Fokuamare is a long, long uh, story because at the beginning, oof, we can talk for one hour. Yeah, yeah. Fokuamare, because it's such a complicated film. And, uh, I mean, might, we might begin with a, a, a sequence now. 
No. But we forget about. Uh, oh, you want it? Yeah. Gra? You, we, we have. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, let's uh, let's uh, listen to him. Uh, number uh, number fierza, bitte fierza. Aber nu, uh, sobald mir die uh, Friedhof gesendet abbrach. Is there a screening after this here? I don't know. No. Because for me we can go. If you are not tired, <laughs> we can push it like 10, 15 minutes. Eh, this. Yeah, for you is okay. Yes. And if there is no problem with it. And I. Because of uh, and I, uh, I have to uh, announce that we have an aperitif and drink afterwards for all of us in the bar of the festival. So it's mean it's, it's good to pl to stay the, till the end. The ones leaving before no uh, no drink uh, no drink. <laughs> But we, I I got the message so a drink for all of us afterwards. So uh, also numero numero vier bitte bis zum Friedhof. essere utilissimo a diffondere l'allarme devo però isolarlo isolarlo pulito Anche in linea teorica una, una sonda che eh, mi trasmette le vibrazioni perché eh, loro sentono sicuramente oltre al... insomma non hanno le orecchie come noi, loro sono immersi in una massa, no? e quindi sentono molto di più eh, per contatto sono dei suoni che si trasmettono all'interno di un corpo solido non hanno la, la stessa la stessa non hanno la, la stessa situazione umana esatto se io riesco a trasmettere alla massa questo grido di allarme Per me è importante perché poi posso farci altre cose, da una parte. Dall'altra parte ci sono dei suoni, dei suoni di richiamo e quindi se io opero, di fatto voglio operare, operare il push-pull, ovvero sia da una parte li voglio richiamare e dall'altra parte li voglio terrorizzare. Questo è bello, questo è l'antipasto della vendetta, mi è caro. Oh, oh. Merci. Escute, merci. Yeah, boiling the, uh, the, 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 the poison. Yeah, he's like an alchemist. Yes. Yeah. So he he's speaking about this 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 uh, insects inside of the palm tree. Yeah. So because uh, Rome was devastated, all the palm tree in Rome where they were dying, and he's a palmologist. Uh, he's a 
mathematician, biologist, pulmonology, economist, like he's incredible um, character and uh, man, not character. He's a fantastic life he has and he lives in this place remote, completely remote from everywhere, everywhere. And again, I met him uh, first um, through the, the tour that we did with, uh, with um, uh, yeah, so it was an encounter. But then I knew, never knew how to film him. And, um, and, uh, but his place was so fascinating. And a lot of time I was spending time there and sleeping at his place with my camper. So I parked there, we spent talking, eating a bit together. I was using the place as a sleeping place. Like I was between the place, uh, the castle and this place here where I, my, my base was on the ground. But I, I thought it was so complicated to film him. And after probably a year I was filming, he called me and said, also my pond had been attacked by the insects and they're all dying. And I went there and I started filming this diagnosis. So everything that happened was somehow sudden. There, you know, before the guy he left that he said I was staged things, but it was not about stay, it was about spending again time. You know, I knew him so in, well enough that then he called me and said, come. You have to witness this. And so all the thing that came about him in the film was shot basically in two days. And there was this explosion of fear of the And then suddenly he became a character in the film, you know, but was just at the end of the whole process. Again, because I had a strong relationship with him. But, and you, I was able to... And he it. makes something we've never seen before. He, he introduces microphones yeah. inside of the palm tree. It, it sounds really weird. You know, Sakamoto, that he was uh, the jury in Venice, uh, when the film uh, won in Venice, he was a part of the jury, and he wanted to meet me. And then when Sakamoto, I, the musician. The musician, yeah. yeah. When I went to Japan, he invited me, and I, he said that after, after this film, he started recording sound of plants, and he did his new uh, CD with the sound of the plants. Uh, so taken by this. He was in the jury, and so he was extremely fascinated by this introducing and so that his next his music was like based on that so it was fascinating it was interesting this mm. more difficult more painful to film in conditions in this in case of Fokuamare con with uh, with uh, Athelens uh, Fokuamare was a long process because you know um, again it's so complicated to talk about that film Lampedusa is a place at uh, the extreme lamp of uh, the, the, the yeah. is a is a door of Europe, you know, and for years, 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 migrants will arrive in Lampedusa, arriving with their own boats, go there, stay one day in Lampedusa, two days Lampedusa, move on, and then move around Europe. Then suddenly migration became a huge, huge, huge uh, political issue, and Lampedusa changed. You know, when I went to Lampedusa, it was the first time they were like happening, and the, the politics was getting big about these migrants arriving, invading, and being Lampedusa. So suddenly the whole eyes was on this island, and everybody started talking about Lampedusa. And uh, and again, I was asked to go to Lampedusa to to film like a small film, a short film there to see what was going on there. And I went there, and I say it's impossible for me to make a movie here. And I was very sick, I got a bronchitis there, and I was leaving, and then uh, before taking my plane, and I didn't know if I was able to leave, I, I went to the hospital and I met Dr. Bartolo there. And I told him I was here, tried to make a movie, but for me was, I didn't understand how I was, could have, this is such a complicated thing, so would be, and I was giving up my project. And he said, no, you have to come, he saw the, the film uh, Sacco Gra, so he knew about this film here. He said, no, you have to come here and make this film. And he gave me a small USB pen, and he said, go home, look at this, and I'm sure you're going to come back and film here. And in this uh, USB pen I put in my computer was like 20 years of witnessing people die on the sea. It was tragic, whatever I saw on that uh, pen there. It was like all his 20 years that he, he um, uh, witnessed. And then I decided to go back there and film. When I went back to film, we had the budget, we have the agreement from the producer, everything. And I went back, suddenly Lampedusa was stopped. The center was stopped. There was a new law, Mare Nostrum. The border was moved in the middle of the sea. Everything changed. No migrant arrived anymore there for a period of time because the, the center uh, was changing. There was a fire. So basically for three, four months, everything stopped. There was not a single migrant in this island. And I say, well, I'm here filming. 
the approach of the market, nothing is happening. So I start focusing on the island. And that's when I met uh, Samuel and all the people. So I start filming the emptiness of this island. Then suddenly things change again. Again, it's how time they, they're able to structure your work, you know, because if I would go there for two weeks, I wouldn't have done nothing. But I moved there, I lived there in the island for one and a half year. So in this one and a half year, I was able to somehow witnessing the big, big change that happened in this island. Again, now it's changing again because law are changing the Europe. Migrant is becoming taboo now in the world. In European uh, Europe has a big, big political issue against that. You know, it's such a complicated uh, um, I think round of that. Uh, but I want to say, so first the film started with this empty island where I were able to go into the people, the cars I met, like Samuel, Samuel and somehow, again, I didn't know, but he became the metaphor of the whole story because uh, while I was filming, he had a headache and things, and then he had all kind of issue, physical issue, and finally he discovered that he was this lazy eye, and I filmed all that. So he became suddenly, from a hunter, he becomes like, before he, 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 he hunt the bird, and then he cannot be a fisherman. So all the dramaturgy that happened in his real life, somehow it became the metaphor of the whole film in this one and a half year that I was filming. It's so again, how important it is to live in a place. And only like that you can adjust yourself. You start from knowing nothing, and slowly, slowly, slowly you structure the whole, uh, the whole thing. But again, um, it cannot be written before this, you know, that you have to go with uh, people you encounter, the encounter, people you decide that are going to be part of your film, and then follow their story till somehow something happens and becomes a, uh, a very strong narration there. Let's maybe just meet the doctor. The doctor is for No, the doctor, he became... Uh, one of the main, main... Uh, S sequence in the film. But now he's in the parliament, of European parliament. He was elected in Italy, so he's... In what party? Uh, with the PD, yeah. the Partito Democratico, the, the left um, wing party. He was elected. He took, like, th he was the third all over Italy as a vote. Oh, yeah. So this was the long wave of uh, Foca Mare that uh, he became elected, and now hopefully in the European parliament he can put his voice uh, on migration. Let's meet him. Number Arza, bitte. Arza. Anche mortali. Ecco. E 
il dovere di ogni uomo che sia un uomo aiutare queste persone e quando ci riusciamo siamo veramente contenti siamo felici di avere dato una mano a volte non è possibile purtroppo e quindi si tocca assistere a cose anche brutte, bruttissime, morti, bambini. E in quell'occasione poi sono costretto a fare che la cosa che più odio di tutte le ispezioni cadaveriche, no? Ne ho fatte tante, forse troppe. Molti mi dicono, amici miei, no, colleghi, ah sì, tanto tu ne hai visti tanti, si è abituato, non è vero, come si fa a abituarsi a vedere bambini morti, donne incinte, donne che hanno partorito durante il naufragio, ancora attaccate al cordone ombelicale, no? E quindi li deve mettere nel, nel sacco, li deve mettere nelle casse, deve fare anche un prelievo deve tagliare un dito, deve tagliare una costola, deve tagliare un'orecchia, un bambino. Quindi dopo la morte anche quest'altra oltraggio, però serve, serve e quindi lo faccio. Tutto questo deve essere tanta rabbia, deve essere un, un vuoto nello stomaco un buco ti fa pensare te li fa sognare per me sono degli incubi che vivo spesso spesso this was stage <laughs> where is that guy he throw the stones and you say that one of you stage you think that he left Probably maybe I say at every stage he cancelled the the word never. So you say you staged. <laughs> How can you stage a scene like that? But you have to spend time with him before putting the camera there. And I knew before putting the camera I spent one year with him. After one year I was able to put the camera and get this moment with him. He seems to to read a, a text. Yeah, the big uh, challenge for me was like when I did this film. It was uh, Lampedusa has been told in so much superficiality. Journalists that go there, cameraman, documentaries, been the most film. So, but people go there for two days, one week, ten days. And how can you film in the one week, ten days? There are so many documentaries that have been made in Lampedusa, thousands, not one. But again, people go there for three days, one week, two weeks, and then go back. And you cannot do that. To go deep in the film, I had spent one and a half year here. Before shooting this, I spent one year every day with him, having a coffee in the morning, spend, become friend. And then when there is that thing, you're able to put the camera and having this truth coming out of him. That's what I mean. My duty, the truth is like the truth of the character, to grab who is Bartolo. And uh, I think this scene shows exactly who Bartolo is. Questions? We have almost 10 minutes left. Peter Metla is there. Do you want to say something? The mi 10 minutes from the official time or the recoup? <laughs> eh? Plus 15 minutes, plus. Uh, uh, we have a, yeah, yeah. So we, okay. Peter, you want to say something? Hi. Hi, Peter. Hi. Um, well, just because you pointed at me, um, <laughs> I could ask this, I mean, <clears throat> in my own experience, sometimes I encounter people only for half a day, and um, I'm kind of amazed what can also happen in half a day. I completely understand what you're saying, and, and I really admire uh, what you achieve, but I'd just be curious if you could talk about that a little bit more, you know, like, what about an encounter? for half a day with a camera. Of course it happened. This film is full of a brief encounter with all the, the part of the migrant. It's all fragments, moments of encounter. They are so strong, the story about the guys that they're chanting. 
I was on. Uh, we met because I was with the boat of the of the marine boat, and I was witnessing the the people dying on the on the thing. I didn't film anything because it was impossible for me to put the camera there. And then I spent time with them going from the middle of the sea to Lampedusa the whole night. I went to see them at night uh, in the in the center and they recognized me. They called me inside and said we want to do a prayer for you. Thank you. You were witnessing our our naufragio, how you say naufragio well, sinking the sinking moment. And I filmed that. So that was like a moment and it's full the film of this but when you build a structure with like the key it could not be half an hour the story of the kid had to be a one year story no you have to follow the change the things the pattern the thing because in one week i would not do anything with him like zero maybe an interview maybe just a fragment a moment but the fact you know the lazy eyes the doctor the encounter the thing to go from a hunter uh, to a fisherman, try to be a fisherman, and that's not working. And then they vomit on the things, and then the thing, and then the lazy eye. He changed. He talks to the bird instead of killing the bird, and that takes time. Of course, the, the the sicario was like instant. He opened the door, and I filmed him. It was two days filming, not even two days, five hours filming. So things happen, but for me, in order to build this story, I need. Time, unfortunately, you know, it's not the best. It's not that they say spend three years to make a film, because uh, I, I, that's why I hate uh, filming. You know, because for me it takes so long. Before I take out the camera, I can, I can wait th two, three months before I take out the camera. Here in Lampedusa, I was three months without even having the camera with me. I was waiting for Ariflex to send me the Amira camera, and. Uh, and I went there for three months. The producer said, well, bring a small camera, do it, something happened. I said, no, when I start, I want to start. And I, cannot, I don't know what to film now. I have first to meet, to understand the place, to understand the island, to understand the interaction, to understand the people. And then after I understand all this, I'm able to put a frame and telling the story. No. But that's the way, it's not a method, it's not right or wrong. That's the way I work, unfortunately. Another question? Yeah, I just wanted to know, you You told us that in the beginning, and the boatman, you, this was very um, expensive to film, so you just, you couldn't film so many uh, hours, for example. Did this change now with the new possibilities and techniques? Because you thought that you're, you're looking for a frame and, and so on, but actually you're having more rushes in the end than, let's say, 30 years before? I have more rushes because I spend more time now. In, in India, I was able to spend in four years, uh, three, four months altogether, five months. And I shot nine hours for boatmen. That's what I had. Now I spend one year, one and a half year, two years in a place. Of course, I have more rushes, but just. But my method doesn't change at all. I still, when I film, think that I have a 60 millimeter camera, and that scene is a, has a weight. So I don't shoot just to shoot and say, and say let's see what happened. If I don't know what I want, if I don't know that is the right moment, I wait, I wait, I wait till I feel, okay, this is ready now to go. When I was in Bilosila, in Boatman, there's a doctor, the scene of the doctor, and I had one reel to shoot. And he was ter terrifying of having a camera there like this. So I was going in the river every day with him and pretending I was filming. So he got used to the camera, but I knew I had three minutes one short reel I had. And so I, was, I couldn't say to him, I have three minutes, so better be good. <laughs> so, so I was waiting, I pretend I was filming, and then say, ah, fuck, the, the, the wind, today there's this, blah, 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 blah. and every day we go that, till like he completely forget about the camera, he completely forgot about the things, uh, and he start being finally real, and himself not acting anymore in front of the camera. And that day I remember, I said, okay, this is the right moment. Boom, I go for it and press the button and that's what I had. You know, finally it was a real moment with him. But I waited, 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 waited. Um, now it's different, I mean, that was my first film. Now I know when is the right moment to put the camera. But as I say, the time I miss things is more than the one I gain. But for me it's part of the work, missing things. Because only if I miss things, then I'm able to gain something else that is important, maybe more important than the one I missed. 
And uh, I learned always that you have to know when to enter and when to leave. Uh, when to say this is the right moment to film and this is the right moment to go and wait. Maybe a week, maybe one day, maybe. Because there are people that have their own life. They have, it's not that with the, when they are with me, they cancel their life and then and they are doing. So I have to be able to enter with, this, with the key that was only, only be able to film him in the weekend because he was free. Um, because before he was at school, he had his own thing. So I just once in a while I was going with him and film. I was not obsessive, you know, after him, uh, you have to do it. Because, uh, plus I didn't know where this was taking me, all this. You know, it took again one year of being there, of living there. I, I did like three months without filming, one year there from January to January, well, exactly one year, and then another couple of months back and forth. So it was almost one and a half year that I spent on that island. And, for, and the story always changed, changed, and the dynamic changed. When I accepted to go on the big uh, ship, I spent one month in this boat, the first journey, they, 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 didn't, try, they didn't know. I had, it took me one year to get the permit to go in the military boat to film, and they didn't know, so they didn't trust me very much, and I spent one month with them, and not one single encounter. Only after that, they told me that this was a back ship, was not a front ship. So I was waiting, basically one man there uh, said something's going on, nothing happened that month. But it was very important to be in this ship because I created a very strong relationship with all the, um, the people, the captain, the thing, the working people, every day, every day, every day, there, 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 there. And I started filming things that was more abstract, you know, the, the lie, the things, the things that belonged more to the, to the ship. And then after this journey, when they went back, I told the captain, but you know, I w nothing happened. I mean, a lot of things happened, but I was not able to film. And I said, okay, you can come back next trip. We're going to be on the front line, so you can come with us. And somehow we trust you. And when I went back to the ship, because I had such a strong relationship with the captain, with the people, with the crew, I was not like intrusive there. Everybody was helping me to 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 be able to say, oh, Jafar, look, there's that thing is interesting. Or that. And when the accident happened, that we were 20 miles from, from Libya, Unfortunately, uh, we spotted that uh, boat was with no engine in the middle of the sea, and uh, and then suddenly, after filming the approach of the boat, we discovered that in that boat there were like uh, 30 body, 30 people died under the boat because they were all pressed, and the engine of the boat was it was a gas chamber. So after everybody left the boat and they opened the thing, they discovered that. People, and and this is dead. and the captain, after one month relationship, he told me, Gianfranco, you have to go down there and film this. This is your duty. I said, I can't do that. And uh, he said, you have to do that because it, this is like a gas chamber. These people die. People have to know why they die. And I went under the boat. I was like the worst moment in my life to put a camera there and filming this. I remember like the smell, the things, I was vomiting. And then I said, I have to do three shots here. I did one, two, three shots, and I left. I was dizzy completely, it was horrible. And then I didn't know what to do anymore with this footage. And then when we started, that, that for me was the end of shooting also. I said, I can't do this anymore. And was my last, uh, was August. And I said, okay, for me, the film is finished. And I called the editor and I said, let's start editing. And we started editing in October. October, November, December. In December, we finished to edit, and we gave the film to to Berlin in December, the 24th, 33rd of December, we gave the film to Berlin. And I remember in the editing, I said, Jakob, this scene has to come into the movie. I don't know where, beginning, middle, end. I don't know where is the space for this, but the film has to be built. Like we arrive to that place and we leave that place. And that's how somehow the film was built, somehow to arrive to that scene. But then I had a huge responsibility with all the people in the field, the doctor, the kid, the things, because there, there was no awareness of them about this, you know? So I had to build the film somehow on a narrative structure that we arrived to show death, and then from that moment to find, finding an, an ending to this film, you know? So it was very difficult to structure, but there was only one way to do it. There was no plan B anymore. And uh, somehow I think, uh, unfortunately, um, it worked in the sense that I think that scene is very important that is in the film because it's witnessing one of the biggest tragedies that is happening uh, still now. People die every day 
and politics and political things, they're ignoring this every day, like a thousand, thousand, thousand of people die in that city. We are going to leave with a lot, the end of the film, uh, and then we're going to have a, a drink. Uh, Gianfranco, uh, you coming back from another night, Notturno is the title of your next film. Uh, could you please just uh, confirm that we're going, you're going to be back here in order, Alive, in, in order allowed, in order to to speak about this last film you shot, and and you came you came back exhausted. Yeah, I spent uh, one year there, and still and and you're still convinced I, I, to make to be a filmmaker. I, I said this is really my last. <laughs> yeah, you, t you told me at the phone. He's <laughs> edited probably. <laughs> Then I mean, something's gonna happen again. But uh, no, but it was very difficult to film in a territory again when millions of films are made, you know, about war, about things, about devastation. And I'm going this year in the territory where ISIS was and the devastation, all these borders, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Kurdistan, you know, the, the territory of ISIS. And now there's a moment of suspension there. And with this film, that's what I want to create, you know a passage of this. I mean, these borders, they were somehow the betrayed of history. But then even in the biggest emergency, people live daily life, you know, there's not 24 hours emergency. And that's what I wanted to capture in the film, the, in this devastation, in this pain, in this uh, extremely uh, wounded uh, souls to find moment of, uh, of beauty also and justice and uh, where daily life is stronger than anything. And somehow there is a transformation of, uh, of terror and of, uh, of war in something else, which I don't want to use the word hope, but somehow in a moment of suspension of everything. And you, because I can mention that we, we spoke on WhatsApp when you were up there filming and uh, not don't, don't don't want to be too personal, but uh, you you told me how much you were exhausted, and also by by your experience in the world as a man, as a citizen, and as a filmmaker. Again, every day I experience pain. I uh, saw so that body of killing. I so saw my life was in danger a couple of times there, and. Uh, you sleep and you stay in situation uh, of emergency constantly. Uh, I was alone and I had a fantastic assistant every time uh, with me, which was driver, assistant and things, and we we're only two people. And again, you move in territory that is uh, um, it's in, a, in a constant alert, you know, like, uh, and also not knowing the language was very difficult because uh, suddenly I was for the first time in my life telling stories uh, with people who could not communicate. So I had to find a completely different way. And this was very strong for me because still, I, uh, you know, documentary, that, that's why I use the word documentary still because documentary is experimental and it's always finding a new way of narration. And only in documentary you can keep pushing the limits, you know, of things. I think feature film is like, <laughs> always the same. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's so hard to be surprised by a feature film. But with documentary, there's something like sometimes you discover, it's like, ah, oh, it's fantastic when you can push it, push it, push it, push it. Also the narration, you know, also the way of approaching, the way you're telling the story. And for me, that's the what is intriguing about this, to find every time a new way of telling a story a way of pushing it. And this time, being in a place where the language was not my own language, I had to find a different way of interacting, of being there. When I say I spent uh, one year with the doctor and talking with him, I could not do that. So it was, the dynamic was completely different. So it was extremely challenging to find a way of filming and to create still that intimacy with the people. Again, there are like eight, nine stories in the film, which are extremely thick and very, very strong. The latest Uschnitt 20, bitte, 20, der letzte Uschnitt.
This is the Exodus of Rossini. Thank you. Thanks. So ne next time we need more time. <laughs> it's not enough. We should do like one film encounter. One film encounter. Come back with <laughs> I will. <laughs> 